Are we good, Dr. Navarro? Kyle, I think it's time we um, start. Good afternoon and welcome to the Charles County Board of Education board meeting for November, November the 9th, 2021. I now call this meeting to order. Will you please join me in reciting the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Dr. Navarro? Good afternoon, Ms. Uh, Chairperson Wilson, Vice Chairperson McGraw, and board members and staff. Today, I bring to you many important updates as Charles County Public Schools closes out the first quarter of the 2021-22 school year. First, I would like to again publicly recognize and thank all of our staff. The past few weeks have been challenging as we continue to navigate workforce shortages, supply chain issues, COVID and transportation concerns. Charles County Public School staff has continued to work together to ensure the school system is running effectively and efficiently and children are engaged in learning. Thank you uh, to each and all of our staff members um, for your commitment to our students' success. Today on the agenda are several important updates, including a three-year instructional plan to address learning gaps from the COVID-19 school closures. Deputy Superintendent Kevin Lowndes will share our plan to focus on these gaps. Steve Roberts, Director of Accountability, will share a report on fall assessments that includes performance data for all students and how teachers will use or and are using the data to drive instructional decisions in their classrooms and target specific student needs. Regarding our recent transportation issues, we thank families and the community at large for their support through the disruptions in services for students. We have met with contractors, bus drivers, and attendants, and have received multiple sheets summarizing concerns regarding working conditions and ask for increases in wages and benefits. We will be meeting with contractors later this week to discuss solutions to address race concerns. We need to keep in mind our responsibility to be a competitive employer in the region, not only as it relates to bus drivers and attendants who safely transport our kids to and from school every day, but also to all of our school system employees who come in every day to very atypical working conditions this year and go the extra mile to support our students' well-being and their learning. Indeed, we need to be a competitive employer, but we need to do this within the constraints of our school system budget and guarantee that decisions we make on behalf of our employees can indeed be paid out by the school system long term. As such, the board recently approved a 4% cost of living adjustment known as COLA for support staff. The adjustment takes effect next month and is a result of the MAG study done last year as an effort to move support staff positions closer to competitive salaries in the workforce. Charles County Public Schools bus drivers and attendants also received the COLA. It is important for the public to know that the COLA update for support staff has been underway since this summer when the MAG study report was fully completed. Drivers and attendants receive a COLA any time one is negotiated among the school system and the support staff union, the American Federation of State, County, and Municipal Employees, also affectionately known as AFSCME. Furthermore, the Board of Education also recently authorized Charles County Public Schools to provide a one-time $1,000 payment in two, in two installments to active employees. I appreciate everything our CCPS staff community is doing and hope this extra support demonstrates our understanding of the complex working conditions staff has faced this year. On the healthcare front, as you may be aware, the FDA recently approved use of the Pfizer COVID-19 vaccine on children ages five and older. We are partnering with the Charles County Department of Health 
to host vaccination clinics at some of our schools. There's a clinic tonight at Mount Hope Nanjamoy Elementary School with appointments still available. Another clinic is scheduled for tomorrow night at Davis Middle School and parents and community members can visit the health department website to register for the vaccine clinics. The health department will continue to host clinics at area schools over the next few months. In other exciting news, we have several high school student athletes competing at upcoming state level competitions. This includes cheerleaders from McDonough, St. Charles, Westlake, and North Point High Schools this Saturday at Hereford Community College. Four of, the five, four of our high school varsity football teams, those are North Point, St. Charles, La Plata, and Lackey, advance in the playoffs and will play this Friday at 7 p.m. And you can check the SMAC, SMAC schedule online for playoff locations. Four high school golfers earned honors in recent state tournaments and more than 30 high school cross country students from Lackey, La Plata, Thomas Stone and McDonough will, complete, will compete in the state cross country meet this Saturday here at Hereford High School. Additionally, we've had two volleyball teams from La Plata and McDonough advance to the state level. The achievement of all student athletes, those who come out to participate this fall, are impressive. And I'm excited to watch our students compete in advance. Congratulations and good luck to all student athletes. And thank you for coming out and participating this school year as we reopened. I would also like to recognize five of our world language teachers who recently earned the Global Seal of Biliteracy. The recognition is given to students and educators who have studied and attained proficiency in two or more languages and can be used as a credential for academic and employment purposes. The teachers are Joshua Clark of Lackey, Maureen Stewart, and D um, Danielle Yuri of North Point, Ana Villega Villera of Milton Summers Middle School, and Nancy Jeffrey of Thomas Stone High School. I know, it's actually not my hope, that's a typo. I know that other teachers and I am certain that other students will eventually pursue this in Charles County Public Schools. We're making changes to make sure that happens. As a reminder to the community, we're looking for nominations for both the Principal of the Year Award and the Teacher of the Year Award. Nominations are due by Thursday, November 11th. The deadline was changed from November 12th to accommodate the closure of the system this Friday. Nomination details are posted to the school system website at ccboe.com. Lastly, I want to briefly mention two important opportunities for community engagement and invite the public to provide us with some feedback. On Friday, we will launch a COVID-19 data dashboard on our website. The dashboard will be updated weekly to reflect positive COVID-19 case information by date and school and a link to the dashboard will be shared with the community on Friday. Charles County Public Schools also seeks feedback about our ESSER 3 application submitted to the Maryland State Department of Education. Part of the process of the ESSER funding use is community engagement. Visit the school system website and look under the quick links menu for the ESSER funding page. The page includes information about ESSER funding and a link to a survey we are asking community stakeholders to complete. In closing and in honor of the upcoming Veterans Day, I would like to thank the veterans in our community for their service, especially those who are part of the Charles County Public School community and those and serve as role models for our students. We even have one on our Board of Education. Thank you for your support and your service. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, board correspondence. Mr. Hurd. Thank you, Ms. Wilson. Uh, over the past month, I have been able to visit St. Charles High School, North Point High School, and Westlake High School, and it has been very rewarding to hear from my constituents and hear directly from the horse's mouth uh, what's going on in students' minds as we make this transition back to in-person learning. Uh, in addition to that, today I visited Westlake High School before this board meeting, and I just wanted to shout out 
uh, Miss Ford, who is a custodian there. She is amazing. And I know that, uh, you know, in our meetings, we talk about how much of a difference one person can make. And I observed uh, Miss Ford making a tremendous difference in the lives of these students in one lunch. I was there for one lunch. That's all I saw. And the respect that the students carried for her, uh, when students started getting popsicles out of nowhere and I was trying to figure out where it was coming from, it was Miss Ford. And so I just wanted to publicly thank her uh, for her hard work in being the difference at Westlake High School. In addition to that, I was able to attend our legislative breakfast uh, with our state delegation and commissioners. And I felt like it was very productive and we were able to talk about uh, furthering our collaboration with them in the future. I saw McDonough's Little Women performance uh, with another board member, but I'll let her share as well. Um, but they had a great performance, and I think fine arts and performing arts are more than alive in Charles County. And when we said we were going to make a comeback, we meant it, and our students are proving that point. Uh, in addition to that, La Plata won its first playoff game in school history. Woo! And I know we have some La Plata graduates on here. I'm a La Plata student, so I'm looking forward uh, to see where this uncharted territory for La Plata High School goes. And then finally, I just wanted to impress upon the community that I'm going to be visiting all CCPS middle and high schools uh, before the end of this year. And that just goes... Uh, to further my goal of hearing from all our students directly. And so far I've had great experiences and the biggest thing I have learned and really had reinforced is our students are amazing. They really are. They have a unique culture at every school I've been to but one thing stands strong and that is their compassion for each other and their willingness to get through this year and make it a year to remember. So thank you. And thank you to all the teachers and staff members out there working to allow our students to continue to do great things. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hurd. Ms. Brown? Thank you. I had an opportunity to attend the play at Lackey. And it was, I think it was the play Stoplight. And I took my granddaughter and she did learn lessons from that play. So it was good to see the kids back in action and actually with a a positive lesson out to the public. Um, I would encourage the public to support these kids who are working hard. You have talent right here in Charles County. You still have four more plays. I didn't get to go to the one that Ian went to at McDonough, but I heard I missed the treat there too. So if you're not really going, taking your kids to some of these plays, they're missing out. So I would encourage you to support those kids and what they're doing. I also had an, uh, an opportunity to attend the number four uh, blueprint for Maryland with uh, um, Dr. Lowndes. And I tell you, it told us just how much work we really have to do to get this really done. So there's a lot of work to be done and I think we're up for the fight. <laughs> anyway, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Brown. Mr. Lucas. Thank you, Ms. Wilson. Uh, so uh, along, along with all the board members, I too attended the legislative breakfast. And um, I think that was, uh, at least from our legislature, the most well-attended uh, breakfast we had in a while. So again, I appreciate them coming out. I look forward to, uh, to continued collaboration with that group. Um, I also had a meeting. Um, uh, I sit on the, the Fine Arts Education Advisory Panel. And um, this group throughout the years, it's representatives from all over the state, and it's not just board members, it's a bunch of different folks involved in fine arts. And um, um, I think there's, uh, uh, I won't go into a lot of detail, but I think there's a great opportunity um, with the blueprint, although it doesn't explicitly, or doesn't really heavily talk about fine arts, but it does talk about CTE. And there's a lot of opportunities in CTE and, and fine arts for folks. And um, uh, I hope that we can, uh, we can continue our tradition in the county. You just heard about um, some plays. I attended both the plays, Little Women and, and um, uh, One Stop Light Town, and they're very good, and I look forward to, to the other plays. But um, I'll provide more update. Those, those meetings from the Fine Arts Advisory Panel are once a quarter, so I'll continue to provide an update on that. 
Uh, I attended a bunch of state playoff games, and congratulations to the teams um, and the schools that are still continuing. Thank you, Dr. Navarro, for mentioning them. Um, I attended the virtual meet and greet for new teachers. Um, so, you know, you, you got to eat on your own while you watched. You didn't get a, a nice meal in person, but it's still great. You know, I'm, I'm very, very thankful that, um, you know, we still reach out to our new teachers um, and folks, other folks in this system. And um, I believe that is it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Lucas. Well, I'd just like to offer my congratulations to the Thespian teams at uh, Lackey and McDonough. I did attend the One Stop Flight Town play at Lackey and then again uh, Little Women last Thursday night at McDonough. And please forgive me, but I can't remember the name of the substitute teacher for Mrs. Heil. <laughs> but um, Mrs. Heil, I have to give her uh, many, many congratulations because I know she just couldn't get it out of her heart and she was there in attendance and along with the um the substitute did a fantastic job so i truly i always enjoy student um activities so um those are two especially good ones thus far that i that's it for this month okay anybody else so i i caught the last game of thomas stone um versus La Plata football game, always a good competition going on between the two groups. And I too attended Little Woman at McDonough uh, High School. And I also attended the production of Trap at La Plata High School. And like my colleagues have already stated, um, we have some exceptional uh, artists out there. There are still great opportunities um, for the upcoming um, other high schools, such as um, North Point, is having their uh, production of Romeo and Juliet starting on November the 18th. Um, Thomas Stone is doing Shakespeare in the parking lot. Uh, that's November the 20th. And then Westlake, a live a vintage Hitch Hitchcock, a live radio play starting on November the 18th. So if you met missed out on the other productions here's your public service announcements to get out there and support our our fine arts um and and i'm, I'm did i mention st charles because i don't want to miss anybody because i guarantee i'll get a an <laughs> email as she likes it i missed it um so i want to make sure i get get give everyone their their prompts um and as mentioned we had the virtual new teachers reception we always like to give a grand welcome to our wonderful new teachers that decided to, out of 13,000 school districts, they came to Charles County. And so that says a lot, it means a lot. And as far as the legislative breakfast, I thought it was a very productive meeting. Um, and I look forward to a very collaborative uh, exchange with our elected officials. There's a lot of work that needs to be done and we need to continue that collaboration. Um, I wanna um, reinforce the concept of partnerships and partnerships with our parents, with our parents and our guardians um, and our community organization. It, especially now, we need everyone um, to work together and reinforce positive behaviors. And as my uh, fellow colleagues have already indicated, there's a lot of positive activities available through the school system for us to, to engage in on. Instead of taking on that, um, that um, uh, you know, threat or, or, or uh, offer to do some kind of practical joke, now's the time to, to stay focused and stay on task you know, be positive, stay positive, and engage in positive activity. We, we, we need to get back to normal, and the way that we get back to normal is, is engaging and being supportive. I wanna reinforce the, the, the announcement that Dr. Navarro has already mentioned before, is that we do need feedback from the public about the use of COVID-19 relief funding, and there is a suspense of November the 18th. I also like to re, um, 
share again. And though, the, though there has been press releases, there's always this inundation of information that the Charles County branch of the NAACP has a orientation and kickoff November the 18th uh, for their AXO um, program. And AXO stands for Academic, Cultural, Technological, and Scientific Olympics. It is an awesome uh, program. Uh, as a former member of the NAACP, I was on the committee um, uh, at, that worked with this. Um, and they are re-engaging this program. And again, this is November the 18th. Um, those are two good examples of partnerships of where we're asking for feedback, we're asking for volunteers, um, we're asking for mentors, and we need to continue to seek ways to find, to, to do things in a positive manner, because this is how we're going to get through COVID-19. Um, and I would just say, we get a lot of emails. We, we run into uh, folks in the grocery store, at the gas station. We obviously, we go to plays. Uh, we go to athletic events, you know, to the teachers and the staff. It will never, ever get old in telling you, we know that you're working hard and we know that you're doing a lot of heavy lifting. Hang in there. We, we're going to get through this. We're going to find ways to make it better for you. And half the challenge is to acknowledge that it has been difficult and that it has been hard and that we do read your emails and we do lose sleep about it. And we know, we know that you're giving it 110%. And we know many, many of the teachers, um, administrators, and support staff uh, in an indirect way, will watch, watch our, our board meetings and, and listen very carefully what we talk about. Um, and there are things that you don't get to hear and see, but we are trying to find a way to make things better. So I just wanted to, to share that I know that uh, it's, been a, it's, been, it's been a long year, a long year. And I wish I had a a magic wand to quickly make it better. But we'll make it better if we continue to work together and move forward. And lastly, what I would say is happy Veterans Day to all of our veterans out there, big hua. So th <laughs> thank you very much. Next on our agenda, we will have Mr. Sean Heil, President of the Education Association of Charles County. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, Madam Vice Chair, Board of Education, Dr. Navarro, and distinguished guests and colleagues. This year, what is the cost of this year? Educators are doing things they never thought they would be doing. I said in my first comments of the year in September that we are in danger of breaking the institution of education under the current conditions, and those conditions have not improved. Teachers are teaching out of their content, directing traffic, drowning in caseload work, and some are working in different buildings to help during these exceptionally challenging days. The amount of work that is required outside the duty day is also increased. Special Ed has been particularly hit hard in this area due to the changes in the mandates that are already burdensome and infringe on the time that students need with their educators. Educators are taking days off during this teacher shortage, not for their own mental health, but to complete work. This could be special ed casework or the English teacher who must teach math this year the new teacher who could never have anticipated the current impact of the new teacher shortage and what that would mean to their workload, or just trying to stay afloat in the pandemic that we are all still experiencing. Educators are concerned about our students, our peers, ourselves, our families, and the ultimate impact of the current working conditions on our profession. As I look to other counties in Maryland and other states across the country, I do remain proud that I'm an educator in Charles County. The Board of Education, along with Dr. Navarro, have been working to look at different remedies to try and stop the bleeding. Offering Friday, the November 12th off now and not later will give educators a needed day to try and breathe from the tasks they've been asked to do this year. I have never seen a year where time for educators was so directly linked to their own mental health. The day that was offered was a good band-aid. 
Educators continue to wonder if they are appreciated and the approval of the $1,000 check across the board by the Board of Education is another way of demonstrating the respect that education professionals deserve. Time and compensation are both extremely important to navigating through this year. As I'm expressing my gratitude, I would also ask that you continue to seek out avenues to offer time and compensation to the educators that are giving more than they've ever been asked to give before, because once again, educators continue to step up and fill in the gap, even at great personal sacrifice. Please make sure that EACC continues to be part of these important discussions moving forward. We at EACC are also not waiting for you to solve all of our problems. We have some ideas that we'll be sharing to offer as we move into 2022, and our collaboration is only as strong as the flow of ideas and communication between us. But speaking of 2022 and beyond, there's another vital area that EACC input and involvement has been supported, and I would like to publicly appreciate that as well. The blueprint for Maryland's future brings great potential, but also paradigm shifts that can only be addressed with educators at the table. Making sure that a variety of educators are seated at all five of the Blueprint Steering Committee reflects the shared understanding that all of us are needed to be part of this process to increase the likelihood that the true transformation changes in public education will take place in Charles County. EACC looks forward to continuing to work for the Blueprint Steering Committee and ensuring that all educator voices are heard and addressed in the local implementation of the Blueprint. We look forward to working with Chris Miller, the local implementer coordinator, Dr. Navarro, and CCPS leadership to make sure that we are maximizing the impact and legislation for the benefit of public education and students we serve here in Charles County. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Birch. Mrs. Birch is with the American Federation of State, County, and Municipal Employees. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Sarah Birch, president of AFSCME Local 2981. What a month October has been. Hmm. So many great things have happened. First, the instructional assistants were finally shown the appreciation they deserve for substituting when needed. Then a 4% raise was given to every employee on scales one and two. The state superintendent then gave every employee a thousand dollar bonus. This bonus was given for all the extra work and stress COVID-19 has caused. Our own Charles County Executive Board gave us November 12th as a holiday. It will be made up at the end of the year. It is a great time to regroup. The MAG survey has certainly proven instrumental in making good decisions happen in Charles County. ASME Council is holding classes for Stewart training on November 15 and 16, their two-day classes, and November 17 and 18. So far, there is one person interested. I would have hoped for more notice, but I am happy for anyone that is interested. Local 2981 is growing, and we need more stewards in the schools. I am very appreciative of all the time given to me by Dr. Navarro, Nikki Majors, David Simza, also my supervisors, Crystal Richardson and William Kruder, for being helpful and patient when I need to go to a 15 or an hour meeting. Thank you. I gave a presentation on Friday, November 5th, for Small Bites on Understanding Your Union. The presentation was based on benefits of being a union member. If asked again, already have a follow-up plan. <laughs> Everyone, enjoy your day off this week. I'm going to St. Michael's for a few days. Hopefully, it'll give me a boost. 
Thank you, Mrs. Birch. Dr. Navarro, I believe next up is Mrs. Acton. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, today we're going to be presenting you the financial, the audited financial statements as of June 30th. Um, Mr. Bill Early, principal from Clifton, Larson Allen, will be um, giving you the results. Joining me up at the table is our accounting manager, Carol Kohler, and our budget manager, Sherry Fisher Davis. And I would like to thank them for their leadership and hard work as we once again um, completed the audit. It's, you know, we're still it was the first time for Carol, so there were a few uh, bumps in the road, but we, we made it in the nick of time. I won't tell you how close it was, but it was pretty close. Bill does not want that to happen again, neither does Karen, but we <laughs> did it. So congratulations, and now I'll turn it over to uh, Mr. Early. Thank you, Karen. Um, yes, I would first like to start by uh, thanking Karen, Carol, her staff. Um, there's been some retirement turnover, I, I call it, in that uh, office, and they continue to operate without missing a beat. Um, so it was another great audit. Um, I'm gonna highlight some things as we go through here, um, but again, uh, kudos to Carol this year for really oh. pulling it together. Um, Thank you, and the staff, <laughs> great accounting staff, and budget staff, and payroll staff, and <laughs> accounts payable staff. We added extra stress because the manager has been on an engagement with me several years, was actually out on maternity leave, so we added a little bit of extra stress to her even, <laughs> and uh, she still was able to handle it. So, um, But I'm gonna start off by uh, the financial statements. They are uh, management's responsibilities, um, as I present every year. We are responsible for the independent auditors report uh, that is located in here. Um, once again, I'm proud to say you have a unqualified opinion, which is the highest level of assurance we can give on your financial statements. Uh, we do have an emphasis of matter paragraph known um, in our report this year. That is only because there's a new uh, Government Accounting Standards Board accounting policy that came out this year, which was GASB 84. Um, previously, you reported school funds in the back of your statements um, as fiduciary agency funds. They are now rolled up and reported as part of the general fund. Um, and that was for consistency reporting um, across governments across the country. Um, they thought it was better to do it that way. So um, I'll highlight that as we go through. Um, but if you, it is a very large document, as always. If you don't have a chance to read everything, please take an opportunity to read pages 6 through 20. That is management's uh, discussion and analysis. Um, that gives you a high-level overview of the change from year to year. So um, when you get a chance, please take a look at that. I'll highlight on page 16, uh, there isn't a, uh, typically this question is brought up, so we'll take a look. There is an assignment or uh, unassigned fund balance, which is what is left over at year end. Um, some of those uh, are already dedicated for uses, uh, such as self-insurance, uh, the contingency reserve, the capital maintenance reserve, and then the, that equals the total unassigned fund balance. So um, that's on page 16. Um, I'll then move over to page 25, which is your um, gap basis uh, financial statements um, for the income statement. Um, if you look at that, there is a change this year um, under other financing sources, and that is because you had a transfer out from the general fund to the food service fund. Um, and that was not something that had been normally done, but um, there was an amendment during, during the year to budget that, um, and that transfer was done basically to make the food service fund whole this year. Um, and a lot of that has to do with the funding and how it was operating during uh, COVID-19. So, Next, I'll flip over a couple questions we normally have. Uh, page 52 um, is your uh, pension uh, funding status. Um, and there you'll see your pension liability actually this year is an asset. Um, that is a result of strong market conditions um, during the past year, um, as some of you may be aware after um, everything started to come around the uh, last couple of months, the market um, really performed strongly. So as part of this assumptions, um, how you do in your unrealized investment gain or loss goes into there. 
if the market was to take a dive, then that number would go back to liability. But actually right now, it is showing a strong um, positive number. Um, then I'll actually flip over the opposite though um, of the OPEB that we normally talk about. Uh, the OPEB uh, has a very large liability still and continues to grow, <clears throat> 669 million. Um, and that is a um, very small funded piece. So, and I think we've talked about that every year. I just continue to highlight it um, because it is your largest liability and it's something that down the road eventually will be, um, have to be addressed and um, more aggressive funding uh, will have to be put in for that, so. Um, Sorry, what page was that? That's page 60. Thank you. Then we'll move over to page 69. This is where um, we talk about there's the $2.9 million that was the reclassification of school activity funds that was in the uh, agency funds is now in the general fund. Um, so that was $2.9 million in the restatement. It was not an accounting error. It was a change in accounting policy that had to be implemented um, by the accounting staff. And then finally, I'll flip over the most important statement, I think, in, the, in here, page 79, and that's your budget to actual statement. Um, as you all know, you manage day to day on a budget to actual basis, um, not on a gap basis. Um, so you'll see over on uh, page 79, that is your budget to actual. Um, you'll see that actually all the expenditures uh, had a positive variance. So um, by law, you can't overexpend a category. So um, that's a good thing. Um, but there you will see that it comes down to um, $116,000. And again, on a budget of $397 million, it's hard to manage and get that right to the penny. But 116 is about as pretty close as you can come as to managing your rear expenditures against your revenue. So, um, so kudos to the accounting staff for... Um, bringing that to your attention and managing the expenses all the way through and to you all as the governance. So uh, lastly, I'll go through my governance letter uh, real quick. Um, so as I mentioned, we did have accounting. Uh, GASB 84 was new this year. Um, OPEB, pension, um, and your self-insurance uh, claims uh, but not reported are your estimates. Uh, we do testing around estimates to make sure they're in accordance with accounting standards. We found nothing out of the ordinary there. Um, we did not have any uh, uncorrected misstatements and uh, management, any misstatements we did find um, or adjusting journal entries were uh, booked. But again, everything this year, we, we had a really good year this year. Um, they did a great job of reconciling everything before they gave it to us. Um, if we did have a question, we brought it to their attention. They went back, looked through it, found the answer, gave it to us. So um, I, I can't say enough about it this year. It was a very, while stressful, Yes, we did go right up to the end. Um, it was a very good year. Um, and, and again, that's part of us, right? I had a, we had a manager out, so we were working as together as a team with the retirements and everything. So for us to get it done, it was still, um, I think, one of the better audits we've had uh, process-wise. Uh, we had no discussions with management prior to our retention. They did sign us a representation letter, um, and there was no independent um, accountants that they consulted um, outside of us. Um, so that's about all I have. If anybody has any questions, I'll gladly answer. Uh, I would like to, uh, for, for educational purposes, can you explain to the public that is watching that you are not associated with the Charles County Board of Education and this is man, not, man, mandated so that they understand that this is an independent audit if yes. you don't mind addressing that yep I, don't, I have no problem addressing that so um under the uh, maryland state law you are required to have a audit an independent audit of your financial statements uh clifton larson allen is an independent accounting firm um under ethics standards we have to be independent in order to issue our independent auditors report um so we have to meet all those standards <laughs> so we have no association with anybody in management or on the board at all um every few years you'll go out to an rfp or and select the new auditors or retain us if we're lucky to be chosen. So um, it is a complete independent process and there is no promises or, or behind the kind of scenes deals. It is all above board and we are completely 100% independent. Okay. The, the other question that I'd like for, for, to, for, for discussion and it sometimes comes up in the, in the public is the fund balance. Uh, can you discuss the fact that having a fund ba balance is a best management practice and from what you're, you're seeing, we're, we're utilizing it well. 
or managing it well. Yeah, you, you don't want to run everything dry. You want to have, like everybody encouraged, you always want to have a little bit of a savings account. So if you look at it, that's kind of what your fund balance is, right? Um, and we talked about some of it's a sign. So if you have encumbrances or if there's projects going on, you can't spend that money. It's already been designated for a project. Then there's the contingency, though, the three I talked about for the um, contingency reserve, the technology reserve. That's your savings account for those projects. Um, so that is a best practice. You do usually want to see if you're running a negative fund balance, then that raises some red flags. So you always do want to have some sort of uh, positive unassigned fund balance um, on your governmental funds. So this is super exciting because obviously when you get audited, you want to get great news and this is great news. So kudos to Mrs. Acton and the staff and with this independent audit, it, it's obviously your hard work is, is paying off. And um, yes, we're tooting our horns, but we value the management of the taxpayers wisely and prudently. And a lot of times you always hear the, the bad stuff. This is a great example of best management practice and good use of, of taxpayers' dollars. And it, it needs to be acknowledged that job well done. Thank mm -hmm. you. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank right. you so Thank much. You. Mr. Roberts is next. So as, as Mr. Roberts is, is bringing forward the presentation, which we're uploading, um, just wanted to um, give the board some context. It was very important that as we began this school year and began using um, assessments that compared us not just internally how our students are doing with expectations to grade level standards um, but allowed us some tools to compare how our students are doing in comparison to their peers in Maryland and then more importantly also to their peers nationwide um, that we have a tool to be able to go back to and look at where we are what is our baseline for this year? And in many ways, this will be a baseline year. And also where we can go back and compare our improvement and our growth. Um, I do think it's gonna be important just for the viewing public that this first presentation uh, is an important one in understanding the context of where our students are and where and what they look like comparing to Maryland and nationally with um, students that take these similar assessments. Um, and it is very, very important for me, coming in this first year superintendent, that um, everybody knows where we stand. Because for us to be able to make progress, and we will make lots of progress, it's important for, first, for us all to understand where we are starting from. And this year, as an unusual year as it tends to be, we will see the impact of having students uh, been away from our schools for over 18 months. And you will see that in the results today. But I don't want our staff and our community to feel discouraged by this. This is important work that we are committed to doing in the next several years to come to fundamentally rethink our approaches and what we're doing. And I do think that collectively, we're gonna see great strides in improvement across the system. So this is where we start. This is not where we end. And so I think it's just important for everybody to be at the same starting place. But we have, as um, Ian and others have mentioned, we have great talent in our staff and our students. And I am really, really encouraged that knowing our data empowers us to improve on our data. And I hope to come back, and I am going to come back to the board continuously to update you on our progress. So with that, I'll let Steve, Laura, and other folks kind of, um, Karen, start to continue the presentation. Thank you, Dr. Navarro. Hi, uh, Chairperson Wilson, Vice Chairperson. 
Thank you for having us today. Um, I'm Steve Roberts, Director of Accountability. This is Karen Peters. She's our coordinator of testing. Uh, we're going to be, as Dr. Navarro talked about, talk about where we are with fall assessments, what we've already done, what our schools have done, and then look closely at the iReady data and what, that, what, what that's showing us, and we'll be able to compare it to national norms, state norms, and see where our district is. And then we'll talk a little bit about where, where, we go, where we're going from there, and then uh, hopefully you'll get a good understanding of what, what our students progress are right now and what, what we need to do. So Karen's going to start by talking about the fall assessments that have already been administered or in the process of. So this is just an overview of the assessments that we've either already administered or we're in the process of giving right now. So we started the year with our kindergarten readiness assessment. This is a state mandated assessment for all kindergarten students. And then we also, for kindergarten students, have our cadence assessment, which is our universal screener. And then we also administer that to first and second grade students that are either new or at risk. They also receive the cadence testing. Um, also in elementary school, we do running records for grades one through five. And then we also had this year brand new our early fall MCAP assessments. So we tested students in English language arts in grades three through five and students that completed English 2 last year. So remember, these are last year's accountability assessments. So it tests them on the content that they learned last school year. So while it says grades 3 through 5 and English, and English 2, and actually that should be grades 3 through 8 in English, sorry, um, this is what grade they were in last year. So this year's current grade level would be one above that. We also tested students in mathematics grades 1 through 8, algebra 1 and algebra 2, and then science grades 5, 8, and 10. Um, we are currently in the process of giving the Cognitive Abilities Test, or the COGAT, and this is part of our gifted identification screening process. And we do not currently have results from any of these assessments yet, but once we do receive those results, we will share them with the board. And of course, the iReady diagnostic. So the idea is, you know, what, what is, what is iReady? What are we looking for? So we wanted a, a, an assessment or some sort of diagnostic that will allow us to get data for our students so we can compare them to Maryland students and national students, identify gaps in learning, um, identify the need for additional support, and then of course monitor the growth, specifically for those students that are in our ELO program. So the iReady <coughs> diagnostic was something that fit right into what we were looking for. So the plan that we developed um, mostly over the summer was overall who we would test with this iReady assessment. So we decided that we would give this assessment to students in grades one through five for both reading and math, and then also grades six through eight in middle school for reading and math. And then for high school, we decided to test for the reading grades nine English in both self-contained and A-level classes, and then for math students in foundations of algebra and algebra one classes. So the plan is to test students three times per year. So we have a fall, winter, and spring test administration. And the students use either their school-issued devices or they can test in computer labs. We're very flexible on this. And so whatever technology is available to students, they can use for this assessment. And the teachers also had the flexibility within the window to give the assessment as they needed. So this was not the type of assessment where everyone has to test on the same day. St teachers had a lot of flexibility to give the assessment in their classrooms and also to administer the makeups as needed uh, according to their schedules within the window. Um, students tested outside of the window are not included in our report today, so we did have a few students that tested after the window closed because they were out or absent, and so those results are not included, but the teachers did have the ability to test those students and get their individual results. Um, teachers and school-wide users also have access to the student data and the reports, so I'm going to talk more about how they access that later. Um, and one thing that we wanted to make really clear with um, everyone involved, all the stakeholders in the schools and here at Central, is that we were not going to use these results for school or teacher SLOs. So the teachers are still using the same um, recommended assessments that they used last year for their SLOs this year. And this is just the overview of our testing windows. So our fall window was September 1st through October 15th. Our winter window will open on January 3rd, right after break, and then close on February 11th. And then our spring window is May 2nd through June 13th. And based on the guidance from iReady, they said we needed to have approximately 12 weeks between the test administration so that we really could see growth with our students from one test administration to the other. Okay, so now we're going to start digging into the actual data itself. We'll start with the math data. So at the top is a breakdown of all the students that were tested from grade one through 
eighth grade, and then it also includes high school. High school was a mixture, as Karen said, when she talked about the, the group. Uh, the high school window was for algebra students and foundation of algebra students, as well as English 1, A-level, and, and self-contained. So it didn't include all, just one grade. It could have included, depending on when they took algebra. So for this one, this was just the algebra students, because we're talking about the math. So what we're going to look at is we're going to look at three different breakdowns. The historical national norms for, from the fall of 1819, pre-pandemic, if you will, and that's going to look at a, a national representation of a uh, sample from across the United States based on uh, where, the, where they scored in their diagnostic. And then it's going to look at specifically national in-school population. That's important there, that piece that says in-school. So it, they're looking at just students that were taking it, that were in, in person, that took the iReady diagnostic this fall, 21-22. So that's from August 1st through October 16th, depending on where the, uh, where the student was going to school. And iReady is... Uh, is represented in all 50 states across the, across the country. So lastly, the other piece we're going to look at is the uh, Maryland in-school population. So this is all of Maryland. So there's several counties in Maryland, 16 counties, is that what we have, Karen? Mm -hmm. 16 counties that participate in some sort of fashion, not exactly, not the same uh, breakdown as we do where we're doing a full uh, diagnostic three times a year. Some of them are using them in different capacities. But again, we'll show you what the numbers look like across Maryland and see, let you see where those are and what, well, how that looks in comparison to where we are. So as we go through, there's, you're going to see five different levels that we're going to be talking about. And this is the same thing that the teachers are able to see when they're looking at the data for their students in their classes. So the, the the bright green there, the dark, I guess the darker green there is the mid or one grade or above. So those are the students that at this time have met or surpassed the minimum requirements. When you're looking at iReady, iReady is a computer adaptive test. So as the student is set and they take the test, as they get a question right, it continues to ask them more and more questions and, and really hone in on where they are. If they get a question incorrect, it'll kind of back up in terms of their skill and see where they are. So there's going to be, when you look at these reports at the end of the presentation today, you'll see these family reports that we're going to be sending home, and it's going to talk about whether they just test it out. So a student may not even need to go back to certain ones because they were getting questions correct. Other ones they may, they may have to just because they didn't do well on that question, so it backs up a little bit. So, all right, let's check and see where you are. So like I said, it's a computer adapted test, so some students may take a little bit more time on the test than others just because of the, uh, the ability of the test to kind of adapt to what the students are, are, are showing that they know. So then there's the on grade early on grade, and that students at this level partially met grade level expectations. And then there's the, the yellow, the, the lighter red, or the pink there, then the darker red there. So it's going to show students that are either uh, placed below level, two grades below, or three grades below, or more. So we'll get a full breakdown of where, they, where we are. So I'm going to start and just kind of go slowly each th through each of those different groups so you can kind of see where we are so you can see where those each steps were to start with. So this was the initial group, the uh, historical national norms. And on the right-hand side, you'll see the breakdown, like I just explained, the different uh, levels that students could uh, be scored at. So nationally, this is 18-19 school year. And you can see the number down there at the bottom just for this school year. This includes data from 7 million Diagnostics. It's a lot of data put together. So again, this was 1819. So you can see students in the all the way at the bottom in the red and the pink who are performing at two grades below or three grades below. The ones at the yellow who are performing one grade below. And then you're looking towards the green, looking at where students are performing on grade level or above mid or above grade level. So that's the national norms prior to the pandemic. Okay, so then this is the national norm as of right now across the country, again, from August 1st to 2000, or October 16, 2021. So you can see the number in red and pink increased nationally, as well as where that yellow falls in. It's about the same, but then the, the number that are scoring early on grade or mid or on grade is significantly lower there. So then we'll move on to where the state of Maryland happens to be. And you can see that N being 146,000. So this is 146,000 mathematics diagnostics across the grade levels and showing where Maryland fell in, in accordance. Again, this is, isn't the entire state. It's only students who took the iReady assessment. So we can only use the iReady assessment to actually determine where they are. So again, you can see 
an increase, if you will, with the pink and the, and the red there, and then the yellow, and then the, the smaller amount in terms of the top where the green is showing the on grade level or uh, mid on grade. And then there's our district. So that's where Charles County Public Schools is. And that's that, that number, that 14732, is showing all of the students from uh, one through eight. Uh, we actually did test 16,236 if we included high school, but it's not included in these numbers because we don't have high school norm data from Maryland or national norm data from iReady. So I'll, we'll show you a slide here when we get through each of the different grade levels. We'll show you where the high school numbers are, but we don't have comparison numbers for the high school national or Maryland norm data. So we'll be able to show you where we are though, okay? Any questions here? Everybody understand what we're looking at here? Okay, so then what we're gonna do is let's do the same breakdown for each of the grade levels. So we'll start here with our first graders. So the first group is the, the norm, which is the national year-to-date group, which is not, in, this is only where we are right now, not looking at the 18, or 18, 19 school year. This is the 20, 21, 22 school year nationally, 21, 22 school year Maryland. And you can see the comparison of where the national numbers are versus where the Maryland numbers are. And I'm gonna add in the Charles County numbers. So you can see the, where we are in terms of each of those different groupings. And I'm gonna slowly go across each of these and add in grade two and so on and so forth. So if you're looking at grade two here, there is definitely an increase in the, the red, if you will, that's showing up. Notice there's no three plus grades below here. You're looking at students are in first or second grade, so you wouldn't expect there to be three grade levels at that point. And then similarly with the, uh, the Charles County data there, you could see where we are. So we're comparable in the, in the sense of where the Maryland data was. Uh, our, our numbers at the top there where the mid and on grade level is um, definitely slightly uh, smaller in terms of where the norm data was for national. And then moving on to our third graders, this is where you start to see the three plus grades start to pop up nationally and in the Maryland group and then similarly in Charles County group. So very similar, you can see how that at the first, at the first graders, if you're looking at the pink and the red area, it seems to be slightly increasing as we go from first grade, second grade, and third grade. Now this is our fourth graders. Again, you, from here on out, you'll see the three plus grade levels below showing up in each of the classifications. And then our fourth grade where we are. So it, you can see where it's kind of leveled off where the total uh, red happens to be if you do a combination of the, the three plus grades below and the two plus grades below. But if you look at the top of that, uh, those boxes in the green, those numbers at the, at the, at the darker green at the top, they're really small, or typically it's in, in these charts, it's because it's, the graph won't fit, but it's usually 3% or smaller is that grouping, so it's not showing up. So it, it didn't, would, wouldn't pop out, out of the box there. And then lastly, at the elementary level, we'll look at our fifth graders, and then see where we are falling in, in, that, in that group. So in each of these, if you're looking across, the, uh, across, you can see at first grade, a lot less of the red, but then as we worked across, it kind of leveled off there from third grade, fourth grade, to fifth grade in terms of the red, those that are two grades or below or three, three plus grades or below. All right, so we'll move on to our middle school level. Again, this is just mathematics. We'll do the same thing for our reading shortly. So I didn't do each of the different slides. I just went grade by grade here so you could see where sixth grade was and then our seventh grade group. Now in this one, you can see where our seventh graders, there was less in the red for our, for our Charles County group versus where the state was. Still a little bit higher than, uh, in terms of numbers of red that are two grades below or, two, uh, or three grades below. But similarly at the state level, you, you look at the top and the green and where, where our students are there, they're very comparable there. And then our last group, our eighth graders, you look and see the our, uh, our green at the top is, is a lot higher than uh, where we had been in some of these other groups. And then you could see the 
for the state level, we're, the number of red that's showing up here, we're, we're definitely in a, a smaller, smaller group there, okay? All right, so then, like I said, we don't have the national norm data for our high school, but what is nice is on this one, it does show the different, and this is gonna be something that we'll talk about in the family reports, is it has the different domains that the iReady assessment is showing for each of the different math tests. So there's numbers and operations at the bottom, the, bottom, the algebra and algebraic thinking, measurement and data, and geometry. And again, each of these are broken down on the five different levels as well. Um, across this high school level, and again, this is just the Algebra and Algebra 1, Foundation of Algebra and Algebra 1 students that are taking this particular assessment. Most of them are ninth graders, but again, we do have students across all grade levels that could possibly be uh, enrolled in Algebra 1 at this, when they, when they took this. And just to note, this does not include the middle school students that enrolled in Algebra 1. They're included with the grades 1 through 8 data. So this is strictly high school students. Just high school that took the Algebra 1 assessment. Okay, so. So what are we going to do with this? You know, that's, you know, that's what we really want to know is where are we going to do and what, what is this going to show us and what can we really get out of what we're looking at? And that's what was important to what, why we, we, we got iReady because we wanted to be able to do something with the data so we knew what we were doing. So uh, one of the things we want to look at is the two different growth models that iReady shows. And that's built into the system that they have. So the ultimate goal is to get all of the students up to that green level. You know, get them to where they are showing that they are on grade level or above grade level and doing work to, at that level. So in order to do that, we've got to focus on how we're going to get there. We've got to look at the growth. So right now we have our first test, our first diagnostic. As we are progressing through the school year, we'll have our two different models or our two different sessions. We'll have our winter session and we'll have our spring session. And that's, that's when we're going to allow, be allowed to look at where the growth is and what the growth is that students are making as they progress. So we got a baseline for their diagnostic and then let's see where, they, where they're progressing to and if they're progressing and what we need to do to work with them. So um, iReady provides two different models for each particular student, and the teachers have access to this. They can see exactly where a student is. Every single student, they can look at their class, they can look by uh, subgroup, whichever way they want to look at the data. They, we've had training, we'll talk a little bit about that as well, what the training has been to teach the teachers how to go in and do this. And then specifically looking at each particular student and what their growth could be. So there's what they talk about uh, for iReady is two different ones. They talk about a typical growth model and a stretch growth model. So the typical growth model is where across the, the board nationally, what students that scored at that particular level at that particular time, what their typical growth would be after a complete school year. And then there's a stretch growth. What would they need to do to get to that next level or to push themselves to get a little bit farther beyond? So. Um, what we'll do is we'll take a look at the next one, and that's what we're seeing here, the two growth measures. So if, it, like if you look at the student at the bottom there, the, the yellow would be the typical growth, and then the, the blue would be that stretch growth piece. So each student, obviously the student that is down in the, in the red area has a larger stretch growth because there's more gaining that they need to make in terms of their growth. So, what we'll do is we'll take a look, and, and this is something that iReady has been able to provide us. At the top is currently, and you already saw this chart, but it was turned the other way, is where the breakdown was for our mathematics. So we had our 27%, a 26, a 38, and our 7, and, and 2, actually, is where the current fall placements were, are, based on the diagnostics. So then, if all of the students did achieve their typical growth, if if it's where the students were achieving based on typical growth across the, the country, then you, you'd see what our chart would look like at the end of the year. And then even looking more closely, what if the students were able, we were able to get the students to achieve at their stretch growth? And you can see at the bottom nationally between 20 and 30% of students achieve their stretch growth goal. So if all of our students that, that we have data for here if they did achieve at that stretch growth model, that's what our chart would look like. You could see uh, there's clearly a, a, a large number. We, we, we jump from 9% in the green in the top, then we go to 28% in the green, down to 47% in the green for that stretch growth piece. So we, we, we have the ability to make these gains if we can, if we can do everything that it's showing. Okay, so we're going to move on to our reading data. Okay. So it's definitely different, which is very interesting to us. 
So the, the charts will look about the same. So the, the way that the charts are um, stacked and shown is going to be very similar to the math, but of course the data is going to represent our reading. So this first chart just shows how many students were tested at each grade level. And so we have our grade one through eight students, which is roughly the entire grade level for each grade. And then that high school includes students that were in English one self-contained in A-level classes. So that is mostly ninth graders, but there could be some 10th through 12th graders sprinkled in there. And then down below, we're going to look at the data with the same three categories in mind. So we're looking at that historical national norm, which is that pre-pandemic 1819 national norm. And then we have national in-school norms for this school year, as well as Maryland uh, norms for this school year as well. And those, uh, those last two both represent, again, in-school test takers. And the window at the, for the Maryland one is through October 24th. Yes. For us, it was October 15th. 15th. Mm -hmm. So I didn't do the each different one. I want you to go ahead and take a look at it from the beginning here. So this is our reading data. Again, just a reminder, that first one is pre-pandemic, and then the last three are this school year, comparing the national to Maryland and then a CCPS on the end there. The CCPS includes grades one through eight data, so this does not include our high school data for the same reason it didn't on the math. We don't have norm data to compare it to. And the uh, Maryland data includes 16 counties, including us, and then the national data is, uh, represents all 50 state states. So each state participated in some way in iReady. And if you did include the data for high school, which this does not, it would be a total of 15, 542 students tested. And then the national norming data is about six and a half million students. It uses the same five categories on the right hand side. So we have the dark green and the light green for the on grade and the early on grade level the yellow for the one grade level below, the pink for two grades level, grade levels below, and then the red for three or more grade levels below. So same exact categories. Okay. So this is our elementary reading data. So again, it compares that national norm for this year to the Maryland norm for this year to us, Charles County. And if you look across the bars, you can see some same trends that we saw with the math data. So lower numbers of pink starting in grade one, increasing in grade two, and then the red coming in there at the bottom starting in grade three. Um, it does, uh, as the math data did, tend to level out between three to fifth, third to fifth grade. So while it does increase starting in first grade and going into second grade around third, it starts to level out and third, fourth, and fifth are all about in the same area. Um, also, you'll notice that the students um, in the green, so both the dark green and the light green for Charles County are generally about the same as the Maryland numbers. And our red is about the same or maybe slightly less than the Maryland numbers. So this is our six through eight, so our middle school reading data. Again, same five categories, and you can see um, the percents in each of those categories. Um, there are Generally, from 6th to 7th to 8th grade, about the same amount of students in that red or the pink with the red and pink combined. And then also, if you look at the green for Charles County, we're about the same as or slightly better than the Maryland norms. And then our red is actually a little bit lower than the Maryland norms in all three grade levels. This is the high school reading data, and just again, this includes students taking English 1, A-level, or self-contained, so this does not include students taking honors courses. And it has those same five categories again, so you can see the percents of students falling into each category, and this is 1,025 students worth of data. Down below, you can see the breakdown for the different domains, and these are the same domains that the teachers and the school-based users can see, so when they're looking at student data, they're able to go in and look at the specific domains and how students performed, and they can look at that as a group or a class or a school or a grade, or they can look individually at students and really dig down in to see what areas students need to work on. So for the reading, um, the top three are kind of our foundational reading skills. So we have phonological awareness, phonics, and high frequency words, and you can see our high school students did very well there. And then the bottom three are kind of our vocabulary comprehension areas. So we have vocabulary, um, comprehension of literature and comprehension of informational text. So teachers can see the breakdown between the different types of text that the students saw on the test. Okay. So again, we're looking at this same growth model with our reading. Um, it's important to remember that these targets established for students are based on their individual performance on that baseline or that full test. 
So when we're looking at both the typical and the stretch growth, it's based on how that student performed on the fall test and then uh, calculates a growth for that individual student. So it is very individual to how that student performed on this adaptive assessment. So again, with that typical growth, it's based on comparisons to how students in that grade level taking that test, scoring at that score that they started with at the beginning of the year, how much growth they would typically make in a school year. And then we have that stretch growth, which is where we really want to push students to get them on grade level um, where they need to be. And then if we look at student growth, again, this same chart that we looked at for math is here for reading. So that top bar looks at our students' fall placements. So again, if you take that bar that we looked at before and kind of turn it on its side, you have the red on the left and the green on the right. And this shows where we are starting with the fall scores that we just received. So you have the 24 and 21 in the red, the 32 in the yellow, and 13 and 10% in the green. And then if all students achieved their typical growth, which is based on how students normally perform from that score point, um, this is what it would look like at the end of the school year for our district. And again, this is just grades one through eight. And then if all students achieve their stretch growth, that bottom bar is what our results would look like at the end of the school year. And you can see the growth from where we are to the typical growth to the stretch growth. The green goes from 23 to 37 to 57. So we're going to talk a little bit about where, what we've done as a system to prepare our teachers, our schools, our, our staff for the iReady assessment and where we're headed from there. Okay. So over the summer at the uh, Ronald G. Cunningham Leadership Institute, we did administrator training for our principals, vice principals, and our administrative interns. So that was more of an introductory, introductory session to iReady so they could see what the test was, how it worked. Um, get a little bit of an idea of the types of results that they would receive once the test was complete and just give them an idea of what this test is that we're going to be giving in the fall and how they can start thinking about how to administer it in their schools. We also did summer training for ILT and test coordinators um, to give them also that introduction but a little bit more on test administration so they could start thinking about schedules, start thinking about how they're going to be using the different devices in their buildings that are available to test students and start to get a testing plan in place with their school administration. Um, then we did back to school training for teachers and this again was that intro for teachers and then also their test administration training. And we did training for all elementary teachers, and then we did all high school teachers and middle school reading teachers at the back to school. And this was their, their training to really get in and see how to give the test, what environment should I set up in my classroom so I can get the best results, and then how to um, deal with any um, concerns or issues that come up during testing to ensure that we're getting valid results for our students. And then we had fair day training for um, several different groups of teachers and ILT mm -hmm. test coordinators. So teachers that um, middle school math that did not receive their introductory training for back to school got their introductory training then because they were in a different training at back to school. And then for the other groups on fair day, we started to look at how do you access your data? So what numbers can you get out of this? What screens do you go to? How do you run reports? And so we started training them on how to go in and actually get the data out for students that had tested so far. Then we moved into more of uh, individual data dives with the middle and the high schools that involved teachers, ILT, and administrators. And these were facilitated by iReady. Um, instructors where they took the groups through their data, showed them really specifically how to go in and look at their specific students' information, how to analyze it, and how to use that data to go forward with an instructional plan. And then coming up, we have planned um, training for our principals at a principal meeting. We have a parent night to help them understand that family report, and we're going to be distributing the family reports to the parents. So for the data analysis part, we, this was after the assessments were complete, all the, after the diagnostics were complete, we had it, it set up and we're going to do it again in the winter where we had iReady, as Karen said, iReady go to the schools and what we also had were content specialists that were present with that. So it was nice to just have the teachers that were administering, whether it was math or, or the reading part, working with iReady, looking at the data, look, 
giving them some real specific tools as to what they can use in terms of the classroom, looking at the reports, looking at what exactly is available and what they can do to cater their needs to it. And we also had schools that did the same thing with their administrators so they understood the, the entire process and what was going on. So that was unbelievably helpful to have administrators involved in that process. So we had, that took place at the end of the uh, assessments and then we're going to do the same thing at the end of the winter assessments. And at that point, we'll be able to look at where the growth is and what the growth tells us for each of these students and the groups and how the teachers can use that growth model and how they can adjust their, the schools can adjust their ELO plans and such to meet the needs of the kids. For elementary school, we're also doing training at their ILT meetings. So ILT members are getting um, pieces of this uh, iReady training at each of their meetings so far so they'll be able to go back and do very specific grade level meetings with teachers include administrators on the different pieces that are available to teachers and the different data that they can look at and each of the contents uh, specialists at the elementary level will be visiting each school as well to go over the data specifically so for the reading and math. So it's, it's gonna be very comprehensive between now and as we finish through December. So then, you know, what is our expectation for the data? That was something that we really looked at closely. So we wanted to look at what, what's a grade level review, the analysis, the monthly planning, what's going on currently. The expectation is, you know, central office needs to look at this data need to have data analysis. So we have an, uh, an iReady implementation team here that initially we were meeting once a week, now we've been meeting twice a week. We meet with iReady for a certain amount of time and then we move into our own meeting afterwards to continue the, the thoughts based on what we've pre been presented. I don't think that's me. Uh, the, then the data review with content specialists. Similarly, we have content specialists that are on that team and then looking at the growth and aligning our priorities. And then if you take a look at that number four, we're very proud of this, that we've worked together as a group and we've come up with two different data analysis tools that system-wide will be used. One is the AAA, which is the classroom level. And this really allows the teacher to look at a cyclical process of looking at their data. What's the, what's the concern? And working through exactly what they need to do and identifying the problem and going from, going from start to finish and then completing the process. And then lastly, looking at the TAPIT piece, which is a school-wide and central office-wide. We did this TAPIT process with the principals last week, so they got a real, not last week, the last month at the principals meeting, did the TAPIT process and looking towards what can they do as a full system and w walking through the entire process of analyzing the data and getting to a, a final product. So it's, it's exciting that we're, we're on a, a path of using common language and common processes for looking at data and what we're going to do with it. And we also wanted to create something that's, that schools and the system would be able to use not just for iReady data, but for any type of data they were looking at with their school buildings or the system, because we really, really want to reinforce that idea of a cyclical approach of always coming back to where you left off and then reevaluating to see where you are again and coming back again to see well, this is what I tried and so maybe did it work did it not work let's reevaluate and look at our data again so we wanted something that was not just for iReady data but for any data that schools and teachers in the system would receive so then as we talked about there's the, the, the last piece of the the diagnostic part is making sure that the families understand where they are. So there is a family report and we're going to be as a as our office is printing them now, we're going to be distributing them to the schools so they can give them to the to the students, to the families to take home and there's resources that the parents are going to be able to see. So as Karen mentioned in the process of the last little box that she had there was having a family meeting and we'll, we'll look at the times, but I do want you to see what this report looks like. So here's an example of the reading family report. First at the top there in number one on grade level scoring range, the families will see the on grade level what that would look like. So what's the range of data or what's the range of scale score that a student would have to score to fall in that on grade level. So uh, at the seventh grade, you can see this is an example of a seventh grade one. At the seventh grade level, the on grade level is 508 to 574. Then if you look down the number two, the student placement with date, it will tell the family when the student took the test and what their specific score was. And then number three, what percentile they were in terms of their, their value. This is, I'm sorry, this is a third grade one, not a seventh grade one. So if, if you see that, if you look at number three, it says 60th percentile. So that 60th percentile is saying that this student scored 
better than 60% of the other students who took the exact same diagnostic. And then number four, this is where we were, I was talking about earlier about the, uh, the levels for each of these different, and you're seeing those domains again. Again, this is the reading report. So it's talking about the number four student domain summary. So tested out means that that student, and when they're taking that test, they actually didn't, they didn't have to, maybe they didn't have to go back to those particular questions or they've completed everything necessary so that when they first started, they, it was able to determine that they didn't need to do, to go back to previous domains. And then if it's a max score that they, they, they actually did test on that piece of it and they did everything essentially correct. And then the other part is it's going to tell them whether they're at grade level or they specifically needs, need improvement. So it does a breakdown for that. And this, this is another nice feature. If you look at number five, for the reading score, it gives them a Lexile level. And then with that, the families can go in and they can go to this Lexile piece and they can actually pick a book at the correct Lexile level for a student so they can read at the level that they've scored based on their iReady component. And those Lexile websites are very nice. Generally, parents can go in and put in the Lexile score for their student and select the types of books or the, the content that they're interested in, and it will give parents book lists that they can use either at the library or at a bookstore. So similarly, the math shows similar uh, breakdowns, except it doesn't have the uh, Lexile level. And then I know it's a little cut off there, but down below it does have explanations of what these scores are. So it talks about what is a scale score, what is a percentile, and describes those and has a nice description for the parents. And it'll have each of the different, the, the, the back page of the report will have each of the different domains and it has a specific workings for what they, that student would need to do to, to get to that next level or where they currently are. So it's, it's very specific, catered sp just to that, that particular student. So then looking in terms of how is this family connection piece going to look, we're, iReady is helping with the training at the principal and resource teacher training on November 17th to make sure that they understand fully how to go about reading these reports and making sure that they understand what we're doing for the distribution for them. We're going to send the family reports home the week of December 1st through the 3rd. The students can log into their iReady right now and see what their scale score is, but it doesn't have any of this breakdown. So they don't, don't, won't necessarily know what that means. But on Dece that week of December 1st through 3rd, they're going to get those reports in their hands. The schools will be distributing them. They're going to have a printed copy to go home. We're going to print them so that you know, we talk a lot about what teachers are doing, how much work it is, and we, we know how hard it is for them and the work that they're doing. So our office is already printing, sorting. All they're going to have to do is they'll get them in their hand, they'll just give them to the students. So it's something that they won't have to go about doing on their own. It's going to be ready for them to hand out. So then we're going to do a family webinar that Karen and I will be uh, presenting to our families if they would like to participate and see how to read these reports on December 7th, and that'll be via Zoom. So we'll have an, an open webinar for the families to be able to look. So before we get to questions, I do want to just to tell the public, please, 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 it's absolutely critical that our students do their absolute best when they're taking these assess assessments because that's the only way we're going to get good data. And we told that from the beginning when we started with our administrators. Please encourage your teachers. Please encourage your students. Everybody, do your best so we know exactly where you are and we can really do something. If we don't have good feedback as to what you're doing and where you are, we, the, the work that we would do wouldn't match their needs. So please, try your best, do everything you can when you're taking these assessments so we really can see where you are and then we can make, make growth accordingly. So with that, do you guys have any questions for us? <laughs> I'm sure. Mike, Mr. Lopez? So thank you. Um, a lot of information here. Could yes. you ask, so a couple things. How many counties are doing this? In Maryland, there are 16 counties, including us. Not all counties are testing as many students as we do. Some are using this um, for more of an intervention or very specific groups of students, but there are 16 counties in Maryland that do give the assessment. Okay. And this, um, boy, you know, the names have changed over the years. But so. Does this replace a test that we would have historically given to our students? 
like we used to have pre post test and right. which was separate from state mandated assessments and i'm just trying to see where this fits in you know we always hear about you're testing my kid too much and i think it's a very good diagnostic tool i just i'm just trying to get a flavor for that um it, it is given during the time when we would normally give our pre-assessments and then the the winter um, window does overlap slightly with when we would give our post assessments but since we are not giving pre-post we had more minutes in our, uh, our, our time allotment this year that we could put towards iReady to really get an idea of where students are since we weren't gonna have that pretest data. Okay, okay. Excellent. We thought it was important to do all three mm -hmm. sessions so we can really see the growth in the winter and then again in the spring and see where our kids are, are making that growth or not. Right, now that, that's, uh, I think that, that's, that's a good path forward. I think the thing that kind of jumped at me a little bit is that looking you know and you, I think you said it, Mr. Roberts the difference between the, the math and the reading yeah. um, the the math it's like and correct me if I'm wrong I just want to make sure I'm looking at this correctly but it seems like we we, we by grade level kids who were kind of marginal were kind of doing a little better as they as they progressed in in grade level like from grade six seven and eight i think you said it yourself there was more green than the other grades um but yet the the red particularly the the dark red kind of stayed the same so it looks like i don't know that yellow that, kind of that trend together. there it's like it's like i mean i know it's it's they're not the same kids it's it's kids in different grade levels but um those kids who were 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 early on were going to mid and the, and um the kids that were previously in in yellow were, were moving up um and and the dark red kind of stayed the same but in the reading it was well it was kind of opposite that that the red the red actually increased right from in grades six seven and eight it gets bigger <coughs> every year so i just want to make sure that I'm, I'm i'm looking at that correctly well for sixth grade the total red was for math was 60 where it was 53 for for reading okay and i'm just it, looking i'm sorry i'm looking at yeah you're correct obviously but i was looking like take reading for example just looking at the, the darker red, three plus, mm -hmm. it's, it's 35, 38, 44, so it kind of trends up. But yet at the math, it pretty much stayed flat. Yeah. And so I, it, I don't know what you gleaned from that exactly, but it just it kinda, it kinda jumped out at me like that, you, that, that, that the kids were able at least in, in the different grades and levels, like I say, in the reading or, or in the uh, the math, rather, they, they seem to the kids who were kind of marginal moved up, but but that didn't seem to to be that way as much. In, uh, and in and here we're looking at overall for the entire test score, but I know our content specialists are doing a lot of analysis analysis looking at those specific domains and specific groups of students to really get at why those trends are the way they are. Okay. And there's, yeah, I mean, you pointed out towards the end of the presentation there, and, and there's a lot that's wrapped up in those, in those little blue boxes about how you can help kids improve. But, I mean, uh, certainly COVID has, has taken, taken its toll, not just us, but, but a lot of kids. But anyway, that, that was just it. That was, I just wanted to make sure I was looking at that correctly, but I think it's a very good presentation and highlights where we need to address our resources. Thank you. Thanks. Mr. Hurt. <clears throat> and thank you for the in-depth presentation. Uh, I just have a question that we received uh, from a community member that resonated with me. And so, you know, in terms of implementation, how can we support teachers when most of their class cannot access the grade level curriculum <coughs> in reading? And so, for example, how is a second grade teacher supposed to teach curriculum to their entire class when what we're seeing is most of their students cannot read at the kindergarten level? And so just like class implementation. Oh. 
You know, I think we've, we've always, as educators, have had instances where we have students that are below grade level at a, in a classroom, above grade level, and on grade level. Um, in the follow-up presentation, we're going to be talking a little bit about the so what of the data. What are we doing about it? How do we tackle these issues? But what I will say at a high level is two things. What we know from research and years of people tackling this issue of what do you do with students that are below grade level, that we know what happens is if we spend too much on a approach to instruction that is remediation only, we will always keep kids at those levels and they will not advance. So we need to be thinking about an approach that maintains at the core the importance of exposure to grade level because kids are human beings and they all grow at different rates and when they're younger they are sponges, they grow at a faster rate than as they grow older and older. And I think we need to be thinking about exposing to grade level, that's the non-negotiable that needs to be happening system-wide. Alongside that, I think we'll be talking a little bit more about extending opportunities for learning beyond the traditional school day and rethinking how we approach supports for students in an accelerated mindset rather than a remediation mindset to tackle those issues. One of the things that we need to think about is those charts when they show um, what could normal growth look like based on kids that, have, that we've seen year after year what their trajectory normal growth is and what could accelerated growth models look like. What I take away from looking at that, can you go back to one of those slides, yep. please? You can go, that one. What you see here is that this is not a one-year event. And so that's important for our families to understand. There's two messages that I think are important for our families to understand. First and foremost, we are going to make sure families have the data in their hands and understand what students know and are able to do and how they also can support because education is a community contact sport rather than just only in the schools. So it's imperative that our families know exactly how their students are doing and can use a tool like the iReady reports to communicate with their teachers when they go in for parent-teacher conferences um, to see how their kid is progressing and know a little bit more about them. And that happens three times a year above also getting great uh, report card grades and so forth. But the other interesting thing is for us to be able to close gaps, and I just want everybody to take a deep breath, including our staff who are working really hard, the impacts of the regressions in some ways that we've seen in terms of outcomes that are locally and also nationally, and also nationally we see that more prevalent in math than in ELA, is going to take us a couple of years to tackle. And so I think it's that continuous work that I'm hoping we talk about next that looks at those pieces. But I will say, and I will stand on this, the non-negotiable has to be that we don't shortchange any of our kids by not having them have exposure to grade level curriculum and standards for that year. That we have to support their rate of growth and that they have gaps and so forth. We've always tackled as, a, as a educators. We have potentially many more of those instances to deal with, but we gotta sort of keep steady in that, in that aspect. And uh, my only follow-up question uh, would be looking you know, forward to implementation and trying to achieve those growth models that we're looking to put our numbers in the right place. Uh, how do we anticipate proximity learning especially in our Algebra one high school classes, affecting the growth models we're going to be able to achieve. Okay. Somebody else want to take <laughs> So are you talking about the ones where we don't have the teachers yeah. that are currently the there? The virtual teachers, yeah. So we are looking at two things, and I'll, I'll it'll be part of my presentation today, is you know, how do we catch students up that don't have a teacher in their classroom and that has a daily sub or a long-term sub, or someone that's not providing the consistent <coughs> curriculum that a, a regular, everyday teacher would be providing, I think is what you're asking. And so you know, one of the, the, the areas that we're looking at is we are looking at looking for outside tutoring services that we'll be able to come in and identify gaps for our students and we'll be able to provide targeted instruction towards those areas that our students still have gaps in. 
We are also looking at first of offering the opportunities for our teachers to provide tutoring and extended learning opportunities for our students. But we do have an understanding that many of our teachers right now are doing a lot uh, and might not be as interested in the uh, tutoring aspect or the extended learning opportunities that we have. And that's why we're looking for outside support to support our teachers uh, during this time period when we're asking them so much. You know, it's, a, it's an unusual time period because in the past, you know, we would, we would find our own folks and help fill the holes and the gaps that we would, any year, we would, would have a typical year where maybe a teacher went out on maternity leave or we couldn't find a, a teacher because their spouse moved and they moved with them. But a, a school would be able to find someone to fill in for that person at that time. Because of the shortfall in our staffing this year, we do have uh, many more uh, areas and, and gaps that we have to fill, and that's why we're looking for outside resources to help us fill that area. And, and I appreciate uh, both those responses, and I think, uh, you know, it, it's important that we're valuing the work that our teachers are doing while recognizing that students do need more instruction. Uh, and I think you, I trust that you guys are working on a good balance solution that is going to address that. Ms. Brown? I also think this was a, a very good presentation, very detailed. I appreciate the fact that I could look at Charles County and also compare us with the rest of the state. I'm also happy that we're going to have reports going home to the parents and a day that they will be able to have access to have more information about how to read the report. And I just would encourage parents to make sure they take advantage of that so that they can be able to see where their kids are and be able to assist their kids. Thank you. Thank you. This is McGraw. Once again, thank you so much for the presentation. I, I was not familiar with iReady, so it has given me a you know familiarity about what it's all about and what kind of results we, we get from it. A um, couple of questions. Does the um, do you also generate a uh, like a class report as well as individual reports? Um, yes. Are those how do the teachers access those? I mean, the teachers all have accounts in iReady, so they can log okay. directly into the website, and they have access to different reports okay. that look at their classes or specific groups within their classes, or even individual students. Okay. Um, they're also able to do what's called a grouping report where they can look to see which students may have mastered a skill while which, which students may need a little more work on it. So they have several different ways that they can look at the data, not just from the overall score, but from the domain score so that they can plan instruction. Excellent. I also like the slide that um, says what happens with the data, because I think that's really important about what the expectations are going to be. And I, as I look at number one, though, um, which is the uh, grade level review and the analysis monthly planning, how are we going to, and maybe this is coming in uh, Mr. Lounge's report, how are we going to provide, I know this takes time <laughs> and planning, how are we going to provide that time for the staff and the and, um, ILTs to unpack the data? I mean. It's not something that can be done in a you know 40 minute planning period. So, are there, what are those plans, or are there plans to assist them in being able to unpack the data? So I will address that in our okay. I will That's address fine. That in our presentation, but we are we are working with the, the curriculum offices, going out to schools and working with schools to unpack the data and, and really determine what that data looks like. Okay. I mean, I think that, you know, one of the questions I, I think that Mr. Lucas asked was why I ready does it replace, you know, another test or, you know, one of the requirements for the school systems was to have a screener to look at our students to see how well they were doing pre, uh, you know, right now after the pandemic, how many things, uh, where their learning loss has taken place, and then as a system making sure that we're taking targeted steps to address those learning losses. And iReady really is the tool mm -hmm. that we're using to look at, you know, where are the gaps with our students? And we can see it from an individual level because the test goes right down to the individual level, but we can also see it from a system perspective, mm -hmm. which allows us as a system to attack things uh, from uh, the curriculum office, but from looking at it at the school 
school level allows the principals and the teachers to really look at the individual students and to come up with plans to address their specific needs. Great. So it's a great you know, screener, per mm -hmm. se, for us to use for, uh, from both the individual student perspective but also the system perspective. Great. Thank you. And once again, thank you very much for sharing this data because I think it's going to be interesting for us to be able to see the, the, what the patterns are, the growth in January, and then again at the end. So thank you all very, very much. Okay. Thank you. So we are a little ahead of schedule. Um, uh, Mr. Lyles, did you want to come? Sure. Your brief, okay. Good afternoon, Madam Chair. Uh, Wilson and Vice Chair Person McGraw and the rest of the board. It's a pleasure to be here this afternoon to give you uh, a presentation about how we are going to address the learning loss that was just shown with our iReady data. But with me today, I have a powerful team uh, to explain what we're doing as a system, but also how it filters down to the schools and what we're asking them to do and how they're implementing. So, uh, Ms. Uh, Megan Hygerford, our elementary director, Ms. Melissa Meisowitz, our secondary director of curriculum, and uh, principal Kevin Jackson is here to talk to us about how he's working at Jennifer with the information and the support that we're giving from central office. So I want to start by talking about the different layers and how we're approaching it from a system-wide perspective. The first thing we're looking at is first instruction, the core program that we're asking all our teachers to do with the curriculum that we're offering. I think uh, Ian talked a little bit about how our teachers are supposed to teach students within their classroom with all these gaps. And, uh, you know, Dr. Navarro mentioned that it's important that we all start at the grade level. You know, if, I think if we, we think about the way we used to teach some of our students that were struggling, you know, we used to pull them out of their core instruction, especially during reading. And what ended up happening was they never got to understand or hear what was being discussed within the class with their peers. And as their peers were moving ahead with their core instruction, the students that were pulled out, you know, to provide the extra support were falling farther and farther behind. So by the time you pull them out in first grade, Think about where they are in fifth or sixth grade, because every year they fall fallen farther and farther behind. And so what the studies have shown, it's important to leave those students that are struggling within their core instruction and then provide the intensive support outside of the core instruction. And that's what I'm going to talk about here today, is some uh, opportunities that we're going to offer our students um, during the school day and also after school to help get them caught up uh, with the reading and with the math that the iReady shows that there's gaps for each one of these students. Um, the systematic use of data, you know, we're just, you know, working with the iReady, but also the data that our cur curriculum provides us. You know, we have assessments every day. Uh, teachers get, take a, an assessment with their students as to where they are during that school day. You know, every week or every quarter, we look at where they are and how we need to adjust for their needs. 
Um, so it's really taken a systematic approach to all of the assessments, the multiple data points that uh, teachers look at every day to help us understand if we're moving our students to where they need to be. Um, and then from a system-wide perspective, also looking at our intervention data, looking at IREADY data, and looking at the curriculum data where the assessments are given to see whether our students are making improvements. And using that data to really target the professional development that our curriculum offers to our teachers, um, such, such as this coming Thursday, which is a curriculum professional development day for all our teachers in the system. And the supplemental programs. So when you catch students up, the only way that you can catch them up is by extending their learning. And so we have to find time during the school day uh, to help students get the support that they need, but that's not enough. We have to look at after school and we have to look at the summer. So this whole plan, you know, is a continuous plan where you're looking at all aspects of the year. You're looking at summer, you're looking during the year, you're looking during the school day, and you're looking after the school day. Because the only way that you can help support students and continue on the projection that they're going on, but increase it and accelerate it, is providing more time with students on their learning. So the core program enhancements. So this, uh, Charles County has bought um, new curriculum, illustrious uh, math for grades one through, through eight, and then into to reading from grades K to five. Both these programs really focus in on the conceptual uh, concepts as well as the foundational skills. Both these are highly rated curriculums that are really, uh, when you people look at it and, and have rated them, have said they're sound in the foundational skills. And when you looked at our iReady data, what you noticed was the gap widened in third grade. And that's part of it is because you really focus in on strong foundational skills in grades K, 1, and 2. And if you don't do a really good job of making sure our students have those skills, you're going to see the gap in grade 3. And I think if you look at the iReady scores, that's exactly what you see. So we have to focus in on really building those, found, uh, those foundational skills in grade three and four and five and make sure that we're filling in in what they missed during COVID for grades one, two, and three. So the iReady uh, implications. Um, so one of the things that we're asking schools to do is really look at the test scores and look at the instructional day. And I'm going to move forward real quick. And when you look at the instructional day, you have two parts of our reading and two parts of our, mock, uh, our ma uh, math block. And the first part of the, the, the block is really focusing in on the core instruction. What is the curriculum, the first instruction that they're getting? And the second part of that block is focusing in on filling the gaps. So looking at the scores and looking at the assessments that are with curriculums, where are the gaps that the students have? And taking that block and focusing in on during the day the areas that they need filled in. And so, for example, if you have a reading student and you notice from the iReady scores and, and through reading that they're having a real, uh, they're struggling with phonics, you would uh, go through the 60 minute block with the reading, and then during that 30 minute uh, time where you're focusing in on interventions, you would focus in on phonics with that particular student. And if the student does a, you know, some of our students have done well during this time period. And so we don't want to slow them down by only focusing in on filling in the gaps for the students that don't have gaps. So this time period actually also accelerates students. And we look at uh, our students that don't need the gaps filled in, and we look at how do we provide enrichment and we move them forward during this time period. So it really is an individualized time where we're working with students. And it's both for math and for reading. This is an example of the, the, the math block. I ready for, uh, for meeting uh, for uh, the middle school is used in a very similar format. It's really identifying where the gaps are for our students within the middle schools. Um, and when you look at it, once again, the blocks are very similar, where there is an extended time period focused in on the language arts and focused in on math 
and during the first part of that time period, you're going to see that uh, teachers are asked to teach the core curriculum. And during the second period of time, you're going to see that they're going to focus in on where the gaps are. And there's other resources that are provided for our teachers to focus in on during that time period where we're focusing in on the gaps. Um, And this is an example of the, the reading block for the middle school, where, as you see, they're, they're focusing in on the core instruction for the first two, 42 minutes, and then they're focusing in on the interventions and the reinforcements that the schools have for that second 42 minute. And this is the map. And here they focus in on 30 minutes trying to fill in those gaps. And we have. I'll go back. To, I'll talk about the interventions in a minute, but here I'm going to talk a little bit about the high school. So the high school is a little bit different because we don't have the extended blocks for math and for reading that we do at the middle school and at the elementary level. So at the high school level, you have uh, periods where we have to help our students earn credits for graduation and keep them on track for graduation. So one of the areas that we're really focused in at the high school is how do we keep our students moving forward and, and getting all the credits that they need and, have, and looking at whether they've fallen behind or not, and then providing times during the day to get caught up on maybe some uh, credits that they've lost because of being out during COVID. But it's also looking at after school opportunities and looking at Saturday opportunities to help those students. But also looking at sometimes during the day that we really can focus in on students that are struggling in reading and in math because of the foundational skills. And so the place that you would help students with the foundational skills for math might be the warm up in an algebra one class or a geometry class where you notice that the students are really struggling with uh, fractions. And so you might spend that you know, first five minutes of class reviewing how to do fractions within that algebra or that geometry class and using that time period to really build the uh, skills necessary for that student to be successful as you move on during that content period of time. Extended learning opportunities. So this is that time outside of the classroom that we're offering for our students. And in the summer offerings, there's, there's different types of offerings uh, depending on what the students' needs are. Uh, for example, we have summer school. So some of our students at the high school level might need to make up credits and they might need to go to summer school and help make up those credits. Um, and there'll be those opportunities. The summer boost. The summer boost is an opportunity for students that need to fill in areas that are uh, missing based on foundational skills and based on the iReady scores, where we're looking at how we have these interventions that are our, at our disposal. So how can we use those interventions during the summer to really help our students get caught up? Um, and so that's where the summer boost falls in. Um, and we use those summer boost scores and where they are uh, at the beginning of summer and at the end of summer, and we give those scores to the schools to let them know, how, you know what happened during the summer, where was the growth, and what do those students still need to work on in order to be successful. Our special ed offerings, so that, those are uh, identified through the IEP. So when our uh, IEP team meetings meet, they look at whether the students haven't made any progress towards their goals and whether those students need uh, time during the summer to focus in on uh, making progress towards their IEP goals. Um, and so really the special education offers are, are geared more towards the IEP goals and making progress towards their IEP goals. Um, and enrichment opportunities, that's for our students in, um, that, that want to get ahead. So one of the things that we're looking at um, is where are some opportunities to provide for our students to take advanced courses if they want to, either in the summer or after school, to, to help them get ahead. That's one of the things that we're hearing is that more families would like more opportunities to help get their students uh, and move them ahead uh, whenever possible. So we're looking at providing more of those opportunities. The school year offerings, you know, we, I talked a little bit about that earlier, um, that our schools are right now in the midst of making plans, uh, extended learning opportunity plans and tutoring plans. Um, some of them, I think you're going to hear from Principal Jackson, are having a, 
a difficult time finding a, a, a many of their staff members to participate in some of these ex extra activities. And so that's where we are looking at what other districts have done in finding outside resources that have been successful uh, in helping students with the tutoring and interviewing those, those companies and then coming up with a contract and moving ahead and then providing those resources for our, our families so that, you know, even if a school is having a difficult time finding someone, we still have a resource for those families. <clears throat> this is just a, a visual that we wanted to show that this never ends, that in order to help students get caught up, we have to use all parts of the year in order to do that. So you have to identify students um, and you have to uh, target students for the summer programs to make sure that our students are taking advantage of those offerings in the summer. Um, and then that has to bleed into the school year where whatever you did in the summer needed to reinforce what they're going to need during the school year um, and, and share with the schools what it is that, that is being provided for those students during the summer in order to catch them up and also share with the school if the school isn't the one providing that extended learning opportunities, what's been successful with that student. Um, and so then it just goes from the summer into the school year, into after school activities, and then back into the summer. But it also shows you with this visual that it's not a one year uh, and we're all caught up, that it is gonna be a three year plan. It's gonna take a while to really get our students caught up to where we want them to be in order to be uh, you know, with the eye ready, either at or above their reading and their math levels. So these are the supplemental programs that we have for schools to use to help get students caught up. Um, and one of the things that we're doing right now is we're looking in and we're looking at the working with iReady with our curriculum office to really understand what are the cutoff scores that they have and what do those scores mean. So then we can target what those scores are with iReady and, and, and geared and help schools understand what intervention should be used depending on where those scores are that have, uh, are below grade level and then what type of intervention should be used. You know, these interventions as well have assessments. So you have a pretest and a post-test. And so schools can determine whether that intervention is successful for that student or not. But it doesn't always, you know, many students sometimes are successful with an intervention, but it still doesn't get them to grade level. Because they're so far behind, they have done well on the intervention, but it still hasn't gotten to the point where they're at the same level as they were at their grade level that they need to be. So that's why you need both the assessments from the interventions, which tells you whether the student is growing while they're in that intervention, but you also need the eye ready to let you know, are they at a point where they should be? Um, because sometimes it's misleading when folks use just an intervention assessment because they think they've gotten a student to a point where they're at grade level because they've done so well on an intervention. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Principal Jackson, um, and he's gonna share with you you know, how he's taken the information that I presented, and he's been, he's heard, been you know, he's heard um, in meetings and in professional developments and we've shared with his teachers and has implemented it at his school. Good afternoon, everybody. So I, I must say to you all, um, before I go over the information on the slide, uh, you know, in my 31 years, this has probably been the most challenging um, for many, many reasons um, that many, you know, of us share. Uh, but I must say, in terms of educating children, uh, it's been the most critical situation, and sometimes you feel very uh, helpless, um, even though you're not, but that's how you feel. I mean, just being very transparent with you. Um, and so one of the things that, you know, Jennifer, we work together as a staff, you know, as we do it throughout the system, um, and our theme this year is we're all in this together. And, and we, we say that because when it comes down to our parents, when it comes down to our students, when it comes down to our staff, we all are feeling it. And so we, we don't have time to blame, and we definitely don't have time to blame over, over here to the Board of Education. And I said, there's, there's nobody over there that we can blame because we're all sharing this collectively. Um, and, and so and I think we, under, we understand that. And that has helped out a whole lot because it really has to be a team approach. So um, the, the one thing I, I wanna say to you is when it comes down to our staffing needs, and I have to address that first because 
that is a, a challenge that every school has shared. And everything that we have done is, has really been about building relationships. And we talk about that in the sense of educating students, but we, we don't typically talk about that as it relates to our community. And as it uh, has, has worked out at Jennifer, every time we had a person who was in our building who we knew had substituted in the past, we would just have a conversation and say, we really need you this year. We really need you to, to help us out when it comes down to educating our students as it relates to you know, us needing individuals, uh, needing people and knowing um, that we were gonna have an extended learning opportunity to come up and also being a Title I school, we just needed as many people as we could get. And, um, and I will say, you know, our community definitely has shown up uh, for us in that way. So we've had to problem solve lots of things, of course, with the support of, um, of our Title I folks, but also with the support of um, the school system uh, and, and this, this uh, office up here. But it, it has most definitely uh, been challenging. And when it comes down to um, thinking about our plan here that I'm gonna talk about in just a couple of seconds, uh, it, it's all about thinking about the whole entire child. And I often say that it takes a village, and you know, we, we, already, we know the adage about that. But you really have to think about every part of a child in order to take them where they need to go. At Jennifer, if, and I've worked at many schools through my career, but at Jennifer, that statement is more true than probably any other school that I've worked at. Because we were not impacted by the, uh, by the pan, in, the, in the pandemic by just the academics, we were also impacted in terms of the other parts of the child that we typically don't talk about as it relates to social emotional learning, as it relates to um, all of the, uh, the other things that come along with um, me, me being able to uh, participate in an after school club in, in a non-academic way. So in other words, you know, when, you, when you're working with students, sometimes you really can't be so direct to say, okay, you're behind in this, let's, let's do this. Instead, you have to offer a club or you have to offer uh, tutoring in a fun way. So when we thought about our plan, and I must say, I can't take the credit for this, our whole entire staff worked on this particularly. Uh, Ms. Berkheiser, uh, one of our, um, our, our resource teachers, uh, Mr. Gardner as well, um, Ms. Goldburn, all of those individuals as well as the vice principals and teachers worked um, on the plan. So pretty much what you see there, and I won't read every um, thing to you, whatever, but we, pr we pretty much tried to think about how we were going to interpret some of the things that Mr. Lowndes has shared uh, in terms of extended learning opportunities about the whole entire child. So yes, the, the big thing that we all wanna know about is academics. So yes, we definitely uh, have opportunities where we are sharing uh, learning opportunities with students in the areas of reading and math. And of course, that's based on the our reading data uh, as well as other pieces of information. And for us, we've already um, um, uh, unpacked that first set of our reading uh, or our reading or our ready math and uh, our ready uh, reading data when it comes down to um, Jennifer. And we do that through our professional learning communities. And pretty much what that is, is we pretty much get together, we unpack the data, and it kind of works like our TAPIT protocol for the county. And we, we pretty much kind of look at the trends and see exactly what's happening, and then we develop a plan on how we're going to address that. Now, we're just unpacking that. We're just starting out on that journey for this particular school year, but that's been something that we've been doing for a couple of years now. And so that's, what, that's how we're approaching our academics. So that will continue to be ongoing. But when it comes down to our social emotional learning, um, that's a big deal. That is a huge deal at Jennifer. And our parents would articulate that as well as you know, our, our, sta our staff members and even some of our students could probably articulate that you know, I, I need help in order to just make sure that I'm well because I don't necessarily feel like um, I'm, I'm feeling motivated or I'm feeling a little bit depressed about certain things. So social emotional learning is a big, big deal. So part of our extended learning opportunity will be about social and emotional learning. But we also wanted to think about leadership in our school because everything that we do it can't just be strictly about academics. We also have to be able to say, okay, there's gonna be a future and you've gotta know how to you know, uh, move forward in the world and how to do what you need to do. So there's a student council component. Um, there is, uh, the, and some of the things that are not up here, whatever, there's also uh, leadership as it relates to a newspaper uh, club, whatever. We've already put that out to our parents and to our um, students, whatever. So we're looking for our students who are interested in writing, but maybe they are afraid so we're gonna come along and support those and create that village for them so that we can be as supportive to them as uh, we need to. Um, also, we have a Big Buddy program, and that actually is gonna work um, in two ways. We have a Big Buddy program as it relates to our students um, that, are, that are younger, so our fifth and fourth graders working with those students, but also as it relates to our special needs population in terms of our Achieve program and our SOAR program as well, being able 
to uh, make ourselves um, sensitive to the fact that people, are, everybody's not, not alike, and that when you see people in society, um, you've got to have an opportunity to see them move and, and, and do things uh, so that they can be successful. So all of these things um, that we have going on are really about um, one thing that we, we say at Jennifer is that our, our stars uh, shine, and that's a direction that we're trying to um, move into. And so when we talk about shine, we're talking about being scholarly, we're talking about being um, showing honor, integrity, never giving up, and embracing responsibility, as well as empathy. So that is um, how we interpret most of the things that uh, Mr. Lowndes has said in terms of extended learning opportunities. So for us, we are, once again, thinking about all of our students and how we can take care of all of the gaps that have uh, appeared or persisted um, in the midst of the pandemic. So, you know, we have asked our school leads to come up with a, a, a plan of action to address the learning loss with, uh, with, with, with a, how are they going to address it with extended learning opportunities and tutoring opportunities. And our schools are working on this, but I think as Principal Jackson has shared, there, there is some challenges that are still ongoing uh, with our, uh, in, in getting our students where they, we want them to be. Um, and I think that, you know, we, one of the things that, that I want to bring today is some of the challenges also of, of help getting our kids caught up quickly, because uh, we aren't where we want to be. Um, we want, you know, we're going to, we are plowing ahead and moving ahead, and, and our schools are working extremely hard. But, you know, they are having staffing vacancies. There is a lack of substitutes, and that, that you know, gets to a point where, you know, some of our teachers are teaching during their planning periods, and this is the period, you know, they would typically maybe work with an individual student and help get this student caught up. But because of, uh, you know, the vacancies right now and the lack of substitutes, they're being asked to fill in uh, during the school day in other areas. And so um, there's COVID tracing going on. There's uh, continued pandemic safety precautions. You know, one of the areas that that has really hit hard on is with our high schools. Many of our high schools used to offer the one lunch, and during that one lunch period, they were able to offer a wide variety of academic supports as well as their clubs. And because they can't get everyone into the lunchroom right now because of the uh, social distancing that needs to take place, you know, they have not been able to provide that as an opportunity this year. Some of our high schools and many of them are looking at, you know, how is it that they can still provide this tutoring during the school day and this support during the school day, as well as providing opportunities to participate in clubs because, you know, some of our students aren't able to stay after school, but we're able to participate during those clubs during the one lunch. Uh, and by taking away that one lunch really has taken away an opportunity for some of our students that have to work or get home to babysit. So schools are looking at, you know, creative ways to be able to provide that, that opportunity during the school day. Um, and then we do have, as everyone understands, students coming in and out and teachers coming in and out due to quarantining. Um, and so at this time, I would, I would like to take questions um, that you might have, and I'm sure you have plenty of questions, and uh, I have both uh, Ms. Meiserwitz and Ms. Hungerford here to, to help answer some of the specific questions that you might have about some of our programs. I don't have any questions. <laughs> Great job. <laughs> Mr. Lucas. So, so you mentioned, I'm paraphrasing, I think you said the only way to catch up is to do external learning, which means summer and after school. Is that, did I capture that? So the only way really to catch up is to provide more time, right? Because the time that we used to have in the school day was always spent on core learning. Um, yes, we provided opportunities for some students uh, that needed it and, and provide, found time for them. But now we have many more students that need it um, because of the pandemic. And so the only way that students can get uh, both stay on the core instruction and move ahead on their grade level and get caught up in the areas that they're, they're lacking those gaps on the foundational skills is providing more opportunities and more time for those students both to focus in on the core instruction and the gaps that are needed. And so in order to do that, you have to either arrange the school day, uh, but by arranging the school day, something has to give because, you know, we only have that traditional school day that we've had forever. Um, and so we really do have to look for more opportunities outside of the school day, both after school and during the summer to help get our kids caught up. So 
do you envision say for this school year do you envision actual programs at the school or would it be something that is done i mean we we've got staffing you know like every school system staffing challenges or is that something that would be done by a contracted service or, or are we not there yet so we are working on that i'm going to let uh Ms. Hungerford and Ms. Meisewitz, they've been working on plans right now with their folks as to how we can make sure that the programs we're offering during the summer, you know, will benefit our students in the way that we, we intend it to. Um, and then as well as, you know, working with schools to provide the after school help and support. So, so I'll, I'll start. Um, so through our grant funding that, you know, we're getting, um, we have a TSI grant that covers kindergarten through third grade, and those are gonna provide interventionists at the elementary level that can provide reading and math interventions. And that can be done, as you saw on the slide, during that 30-minute math block. Um, in elementary reading, we have the 60-minute core program, which we call ILB, or close reading and writing, et cetera. We have the 60-minute, what we call guided reading block, but that can be broken into chunks so you can have your direct guided reading and you can have intervention too. So those people can work within the day to provide those services. Um, for grades four and through 12, um, we've been working with Mr. Lowndes and we have been um, kind of uh, reviewing and vetting some tutoring um, contracted services We've been communicating with other systems in the state that have used these to make sure that they are very high quality. Um, we're looking at that. We don't want to take the opportunity for tutoring away from our staff, but as you've heard, ad nauseum, our staff is stretched really thin, and we don't want to hold back these programs if they are unable to do it at this time. So we're working to contract tutoring, which would be offered virtually. Interestingly, one of the um, tutoring companies that we are working with can offer tutoring during the instructional day. So if I'm a fourth grader and I need tutoring and reading, I go and I have the guided reading with my teacher at the guided reading table for 20 minutes. And then I, instead of going back to my seat to do my follow-up work independently, I can then go join a tutoring group virtually um, with, with the, tutoring, the tutor over the internet, and then that gives me really a lot more powerful instruction than just something that I'm doing independently. And some of these tutoring companies use the iReady data that we're collecting, so they kind of join with our system, they use the data that we've collected to be able to see exactly where the deficits are for our kids, um, and then they work with our teachers to be able to really support the students. Um, we're actually looking at two different forms of tutoring. So one form is called like homework help, where parents and or students can log in and sign up for a uh, time because I have a biology assignment that I don't understand and it's 10 o'clock at night and it's due tomorrow and in 15 minutes they can be on with a tutor helping them with a specific assignment. They can screen share and look at that assignment. So it's great for your older kids who can manage that. Um, the other type of tutoring that we're looking at is really targeted and intensive tutoring. And that's where I was talking about the iReady data. And so they're looking at where the students' needs are and they're working with the same tutor um, in a structured uh, time during the day, the same time of day over the course of a um, number of weeks so that they're working on specific skills. Um, the other things that we're really working on are you know, with principals at their schools. So we've asked principals to really develop their extended learning plans. So what is it that your school needs? What does your community need? What are your students' needs? Um, and then like Mr. Jackson uh, presented, principals are doing that. They're reaching out to their communities. Um, they're working with their staff to determine uh, you know, what they can provide. At the secondary level, uh, it's about grading credit recovery. And we do this all the time, but more so, I think, in the past year. So we give students opportunities to um, better their grade if they didn't pass for the first quarter. We give them opportunities to rebound. 
so earn a passing grade um, for, the, for the first quarter if they didn't pass. And then um, we give them opportunities to credit recover a course for those juniors and seniors that are out of cohort. Um, they can recover a credit that they didn't pass in a previous year so they can get back on track with their graduating class. But I think one of the things that Principal Jackson really highlighted beautifully was, you know, the social emotional is actually, you know, an area that we're telling schools is, a, you know, available and to think of it that, you know, don't just think of the academics, think of the social emotional as well. And that, that can be part of your extended learning plan where we can, you know, help fund whatever it is because, you know, I think, you know, Principal Jackson has shown where you, you, you marriage the two, the social emotional, kids having fun and kids getting, you know, some normalcy back into their lives with motivating them to do more academically. And if you only give the academics sometimes, they just don't have the motivation they would if they had the other. So, you know, we're encouraging schools to both provide the uh, social emotional uh, activities with the extended learning opportunity as well as the academic. And, yeah, if I could follow up on that, I think that is vitally important. I mean, when you look at the data and it's not just us, it's the whole state. I mean, you've got you've got half the kids that are either a two plus or a three plus. So I I, I can't see how any system is going to tackle that during the school day. I just it's impossible. Um, and and so that's why I ask about the outside services. Um, and it's and again with that social emotional part. I hope I hope the kid. I mean if if the virtual stuff worked as well as in classroom, then we wouldn't see these numbers we see now. That now we're, we're saying that we're going to use that same model to try to get these kids up. Um, but again, maybe now they have more interaction with their peers, and that and that can help. Um, but but I think it's just a, it's 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 a very holistic approach to all everyone in the community that. Um, is perhaps able to help in, in some way because I mean this is a, a daunting task um, when across the state you know half the kids are, are, are two grade levels behind um, that's going to take a while to fix so I just I just want to make sure again I was reading the data right and, and wanted to hear what you said because again there's only so much you can do during the school day um, and and when you when we start doing this in the summer or after school you know, again, I need to, we need to make sure that we're being equitable and providing transportation for all these kids, which I'm sure is part of the plan too, um, so that no one is, is not able to participate, participate because they can't get a ride to, to school. So thank you. Just a real quick uh, cl clarifying question, Mr. Jackson. The Morning Stars program, is that before school? Yes. Yeah, so, so being that we're a later school, mm -hmm. um, we don't, our official day doesn't start until 9.15, so uh, that will start at uh, 8 o'clock. And um, depending upon which program it is, uh, there, there's a little bit of a variation or whatever in the time. But, and we felt like um, our parents would be more prone, especially on the way to work or whatever, and like the, the gift of being able to drop their kids off rather than at the end of the day being able to pick them up. And then for our staff, it has been a challenging, a challenge trying to get staff members to do this because they're tired. They're actually, they're very exhausted. Um, so at the end of the day, they pretty much have given every, all that they can, but in the morning, they're a little more fresh and, uh, you know, the opportunity just looked a little bit better. So that's how we worked it. Awesome job, really. Utilizing every, every minute of the day that you can for intervention. So great job. Dr. Navarro. Just wanted to add one quick piece. I didn't get a chance to fully um, review this PowerPoint after Mr. Jackson kind of added his slide in. One of the things that I uh, really appreciate about the staff, your staff at Jennifer that you're doing is that if you notice when he, when he highlighted his programs, uh, these are the programs that I would do in full education of my own daughters, which is a um, enrichment-based mindset of how they're structured. So there is writing components in there. There's student leadership components in there. There's STEM initiatives in there. And once again, 
part of what we need to create, and there's social emotional supports there so that ki kids can talk about their feelings, um, can have coping mechanisms when they're feeling out of sorts in many ways. And I think this is what we need to talk about when we talk about overall catching up our students or dealing with whatever instructional gaps they have, is looking at it from a enrichment mindset rather than a deficiency mindset. And so I just wanna applaud your school because it is peppered throughout your presentation and what you were talking about today, that you and your staff are thinking about how do we provide the learning environment that we expect for our own kids, for every single kid that enters your door. So kudos to you, and I'm just very proud to have you as my colleague. Thank you. Ms. Wilson. Yes, go ahead. Sorry, another, another quick question. We've, we got, again, not its, not its primary purpose, but we've got a lot of kids that are already in school um, before and after through our programs there. I mean, is that a possible opportunity to provide some sort of, of instruction, either by a, not by a live person, then perhaps, um, you know, even if it's done virtually, but, but some, you know, one person there could then be there for, for a number of kids if they have questions. Uh, um, and uh, I know Ms. Battle Lockhart has talked about that before. I mean, because the kids are there and in our school system, but again, that's more of a, um, not so much a learning environment, but a daycare environment. But when you have the kids there, you have a captive audience. Or at least, yeah, at least yeah, before school. I don't know, I don't know how, how, how we can yeah. catch up with those companies that provide those services after school in our buildings and see whether we can you know, give them the resources uh, to work with our students that they're taking care of, both before school and after school. So that's something for me to look into. Thanks. And, and one thing I will add, um, our, our, one of our things our parents have said to us is they, they appreciate uh, options. And so while, you know, one of the things, for some kids, the virtual options did not work, but it wasn't bad for every kid. And so in some cases, whatever, when a parent can't, they just can't present their child live in a physical manner, it is um, nice to have that option to be able to do something virtual. So, you know, it's one of the things I think that we all have to learn just from what we've been through is, you know, you can't throw out the baby with the bathwater. This, there were some gr good aspects of what we went through. We learned a lot. So we're trying to really take what we learned that wasn't detrimental to a, a child uh, and, and, you know, still be able to utilize that as possible. And if I could add, the groups, if we're doing virtual activities, the groups are very small. And it's, you know, I did some online teaching last year, also along with the rest of the world, learning as we went. And it's a big difference when you have four students or five students than when you have 25. Mm -hmm. um, so we are purposefully, if, they, if the options do have to be virtual, the groups are very small so that, you know, there can be a lot more teacher-student interaction. Good point. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. yep. Let's take a break until 3.45. Okay. Thank you, Carl. Welcome back, everyone. We'll go ahead and uh, reconvene. Uh, Mr. Heim. Good afternoon, everyone. Today I'm joined by Steve Andritz, who's our Director of Planning and Construction, and by Mr. Brad Snow, who's <coughs> our Director of Transportation. We have uh, first one information item, uh, which is the project status update, which is a monthly report that we post to board docs uh, detailing the current status of various construction projects and where they are in that phase in terms of completion dates. So any questions regarding that document or any of the specific projects? No questions? I don't have any. Okay. One thing we did want to throw out, uh, typically with a construction project and usually a, a larger construction project with a major renovation or a new school build, uh, we do offer an opportunity for board members if they would like to visit a site 
So we are doing the limited renovation of Brown, which is the open space enclosure. So if there is some interest uh, in the next couple of months, we could set up a tour of that, uh, that project if, if it would be the, uh, the board's liking. Mm -hmm. Great idea. Yeah. All right, next we have a report item, and that is the middle school redistricting. Uh, last, uh, in September, Dr. Navarro presented her recommendation to the board and in October, uh, we had a discussion on a uh, potential vote for approval of that, uh, and we're going to continue that discussion today. So today, uh, I have the two co-facilitators who I just introduced, Mr. Andrews and Mr. Snow, uh, and we are here today to present the amended recommendation from Dr. Navarro, the superintendent. We are uh, not going to spend as much time on these slides uh, as we did in September, they are the same slides, but we felt for uh, documentation purposes that uh, the presentation provided today should resemble uh, the September presentation with the amended uh, recommended changes. So we are not going to spend as much time on the overall presentation as we had done in September. And the purpose of the middle school redistricting was to coincide with the renovation and the added capacity at Benjamin Stoddard Middle School uh, to address overcrowding at several middle schools uh, based on their state rated capacity. So the uh, slide is shown right now, details the specifics of the Benjamin Stoddard renovation. Uh, and this all came about because of the superintendent's charge, which again was to look at all eight middle schools and their boundaries and to see how they could potentially redrawn to provide a better balance of enrollment at the eight middle schools and particularly address those middle schools that were over their state rated capacity. Uh, there were general guidelines which we followed with this and we follow with any redistricting. And next, Mr. Andrews is going to talk about the timeline since it has been amended since the original presentation in September. Good afternoon. Uh, in October of 2020, the redistricting committee was selected and a public information town hall was held on October 26 virtually. In November of 2020, the redistricting committee began meeting weekly and those meetings were paused due to the COVID-19 pandemic. In May of 2021, the committee resumed its weekly meetings and in July of 2021, the redistricting committee completed its work. August of 2021, the board received a report on the committee's recommendations on August 10th at the board meeting, and public hearings were held on the two alternatives, A and B. Um, August 23rd, 2021, from 6 to 8 p.m. virtually, and Tuesday, August 24th, 2021, from 6.30 to 8.30 at La Plata High School in the auditorium. In September of 2021, um, an additional public hearing was held due to uh, concerns about turnout at the first two hearings. So a third public hearing was held on Turner's A and B, Tuesday, September 7th, virtually from 6 to 8 p.m. The superintendent presented her recommendation to the board at the September 14th meeting, and public hearings were held on superintendent's recommendation, which was alternative A. Public hearings were held <coughs> Monday, September 27th, 2021 from 6 30 to 8 30 at Westlake High School and Tuesday September 28th 6 to 8 virtually in October the board um, heard the testimony and discussed the proposal a as presented by the superintendent and a motion was made to adopt plan a uh, subsequently a second motion was made to <coughs> modify the plan uh, the second motion did not receive a second to move forward and a vote was conducted on the original Plan A uh, proposal, but did not receive a majority vote. Uh, the superintendent has modified the redistricting proposal, and it will be presented today, obviously, um, for your information here, and then as an action item later on. Um, and it's expected that the board would take action on this new plan, and this redistricting, redistricting plan would take effect in August of 2022 for the school year 22-23. The next slide, as Mr. Andrews talked uh, during the timeline, uh, discusses who was a part of the redistricting committee, and that was, again, uh, <coughs> you know, randomly selected uh, members who were submitted uh, by the principals along with the in, at general random. So moving on. <coughs> Sorry. 
Moving on to the superintendent, Dr. Navarro's recommendation. The recommendation is to amend proposal A so that blocks 3971 and blocks 3451 would move from Milton Summers Middle School to Pickawax and Middle School, and then there are no other changes to the six other middle schools. <coughs> other considerations with Dr. Navarro's recommendation uh, in comparison to the other proposal, Plan B, it provides a better balance of growth areas, particularly in the St. Charles area and in Heritage Green, which is a proposed development in the La Plata town area. Uh, and that better balance uh, is between Benjamin Stoddard and Milton Summers, the two middle schools who are going to be most likely impacted by the growth of those two developments. It also provides a better use of added capacity at Benjamin Stoddard Middle School. Also, looking at middle school enrollment in the development district is at or near state rate capacity support future middle school nine. So the redistricting is uh, an attempt to balance, uh, again, the enrollment at all eight middle schools uh, until <coughs> middle school nine is built. And then, of course, at the time middle school nine is built, we'll be drawing up a zone where a committee, the two committees will be recommendation drawing up a zone to support and provide students for, for that middle school, which will be our ninth <coughs> middle school. Then also plan A in comparison to plan B moves less existing students. So we're next gonna show you uh, the current maps, Mr. Snow. Good afternoon. Uh, on the screen above you see the current CCPS middle school zones. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go over the changes associated with um, alternative A. The zones are remaining as they were at the October meeting. The ones that I will go over have seen no change as they were presented in the October board meeting. Alternative A moves 1,007 1, students across the county at the school, middle school. That is a slight modification, as was mentioned, with the uh, amendment that's made. That number was 992. So based on this uh, revision that was, is being proposed by the superintendent, it does up that number a little bit <coughs> overall for Alternative A. I'm going to move fairly quickly through the zones. Um, as the ones that I'm presenting have not changed. Um, on the left-hand side, you'll see the state rated capacity for each school. The official enrollment as of 9-30-19. And then on the right-hand side in the blue boxes, you'll see the projected growth for 2022-23 and then for 25-26. So the first uh, map that you see will have the changes by block. You'll see the green that are incoming and any red on any of the screens that you see moving forward will be blocks that have been moved. The second map just shows you a visual of the actual block numbers with the road underlay. And then you can see the last one is the entire zone uh, for each school for Davis under alternative A. Mm -hmm. Next one, you'll see the same features on the left and right hand side, the same color coding being red and green. This one is for Hanson zone, alternative A. And then the following two maps are just the blocks <coughs> and then the roadway underlay with the entire zone. Henson zone for changes under alternative A. Again, you'll see the numbers corresponding with the left and right hand sides. Again, the red blocks will be leaving. Uh, it indicates the school which they are going uh, to, and then what blocks will be brought in for Henson. Next block, next map will show the blocks, roadway underlays, and then a complete outline of the new Henson zone under alternative A. The Madawoman zone changes you'll see there in red under alternative A. Again, the state rated capacity, official enrollment, and then the projected growth. Second map, you can clearly see the roadway underneath also with the block numbers, and then the completed new zone outline for Mattawoman for Alternative A. Next is Pickawaxen. Uh, Pickawaxen is one of the two zones that was, is changing, as was mentioned by Mr. Jaime a minute ago. You have two blocks that are moving in to Pickawaxen. Uh, the state rated capacity, as Mr. Snow mentioned, and the official September 30th, 2019 enrollments are listed on the left-hand side of the page. The, Projected enrollments for 22-23 have increased to 569 compared to original alternative A, which was 551. And school year 25-26 has increased to 587, was originally 570. The two blocks that are moving in are in the left-hand portion of the green in the upper area of that along 301. Next. This is the zone for Pickawaxen, as you see all the enrollment blocks. And this is the third map with the entire zone and the road network underlaid.
Next, we have General Smallwood, uh, state rated capacities, official enrollments, no changes to Smallwood. This is the zone with in or out. This is the zone with the enrollment blocks and the zone with the underlay for the road network. Next, we have Milton Summers Middle School, uh, state rated capacity and official enrollment on the left. The projected enrollments on the right are down. Uh, was under plan A 686 is now 668 for 22-23 and it was 860 for 25-26 it's now down to 843 this is the full zone for summers and this is the zone with the road network underlaid this is Benjamin Stoddart's map with the changes no no change made here in the amendment the full zone for Stoddart with the enrollment blocks and the road underlay network. This is the comparison chart as seen in the original presentation. Uh, all the information is the same except for the two schools that are being changed under this amendment to Plan A, which are Picklewaxen and Summers. And you'll notice that the numbers for 22-23, Picklewaxen and Summers have been adjusted, and for 25-26 have been adjusted. Picklewaxen goes up slightly and Summers goes down slightly. Uh, resources. Resources. Uh, you can find information on redistricting at the website um, that's available on the screen there, and you can also see that on our CCBOE webpage. Explore the interactive map under Alternative A. You can certainly see the new changes that have been updated as a result of this meeting, and certainly email comments to redistrict at ccboe.com if you have any comments in the general public or for staff. All right, and what's next? So as Mr. Andrews mentioned a few minutes ago, uh, we are going to be later on this evening. Uh, this will be an action item for potential approval. Mr. Antris also said we expect that this will take effect for the fall, the start of the school year. Again, to coincide with the completion of the Benjamin Starter renovation and added capacity. And also we'd like to make it known to the public that the staff reviews enrollment data annually as part of the preparation for our CIP and the request we make to the, the state. Uh, along those lines, as we start to see, you know, concerns with enrollment at particular schools, the superintendent can issue a moratorium to send students in a growth area for a school exceeding their state rated capacity to a neighboring school that is under their state rated capacity. So Summers had a moratorium in place, uh, which took effect in 2015, and has actually in place up until now uh, and with redistricting uh, when that takes effect that will do away with the, the moratorium uh, so for the public there were four blocks uh, that were sent from summers in the uh, Glen Eagles area uh, due to the overcapacity at summers who were sent to Benjamin Stoddard Middle School so between now and when the next middle school is built if we start to see concerns at any particular area particularly those two growth areas we talked about in St. Charles with Glen Eagles and also Heritage Green in La Plata, it is a possibility that before Middle School 9 is built that some students, if warranted by enrollment numbers, could potentially be sent to, to another school. So we thought that was important for the public to, to understand. Questions about the presentation? Just to be clear for the public, is 3971 and 3451 Jamestown that is now part uh, that the Jamestown neighborhood? Is yes. that correct? Yes. Okay, yes. that's all I need to know. Thank you. Mr. Lucas. When do you realistically expect the next middle school to be built or opened? So we are requesting in our CIP this year of the state uh, planning approval and funding for the design to begin from the county for FY23. Uh, we have not seen comments from the state yet. We anticipate them usually in late November. Um, that timeline has the project opening in 25-26. Um, I think that Personally, there are some things ahead of it that the state is going to fund that are going to take a little more time that likely would push that back a year. 
Um, so it is my opinion it's probably more like 26, 27 than 25, 26. Thank you. And keep in mind with the CIP, uh, with, from the IAC, the Interagency uh, Commission on Public School Construction, they are attempting to hold school systems to their 10-year average. So our 10-year average is around $10 million per year. So when you look at trying to balance out our projects that are already in the process uh, of you know, construction and, and completion, uh, you know, an example is Eva Turner. Even though Eva Turner, the construction project is complete, uh, we are still waiting on the state's, uh, the final share in next year's CIP. So those types of things when we are behind on the state share and the state share is 65% and the local share is 35%, but those impact future projects when the state is still paying on a project that is complete. And again, that's based upon our 10 year average. So it's balancing those projects within that 10 year average, which again is around $10 million. Um, Mr. Hancock. Thank you. Um, for the block 3451 of Quail Wood, how many s s middle school students are we talking about? Is it 3451, I believe, is Jamestown, and I think it's 15 existing students from the, FY, from the uh, school year 2019 data. And then there are a few students that are projected growth based on the numbers we got from the town of La Plata. So it goes up to between 17 and 18 total. So I apologize. I guess I should have said block 3971. 3971 is actually the adjacent block, which is the, the active adult community. I'm trying to remember the name of it now. Um, the Hawthorne, is it Hawthorne Green? Hawthorne Green, I believe. Yeah. But the, the point of doing that was making a consistent block that didn't have a weird cutout. Um, that block does not have any students in it right now. It's not anticipated to because it's an active adult, but it was putting both blocks so you made a fully contiguous zone. Okay. And in the actual Quailwood neighborhood, how many, how many students are we talking there? And what block number is that? Because I was under the impression that that was block 3451. I think that's 3441. 41, I'm sorry. Okay. And I, I, think, I think the I last number we had was 43. I think that's correct, yeah. yes. Okay. That's existing students, which so, would have been from the FY19 or the okay. school year 19 numbers. So I, I certainly appreciate one of my concerns was dividing the Quailwood and Jamestown neighborhoods, and I do appreciate not doing that, um, but it is going to have more of an impact on slightly more impact on pickle wax and where I think if we were to put those students if we were to to amend this in my opinion what I would like to do when we get to the action item um, keep those two neighborhoods together but at, at summers I think with summers dropping enrollment by 418 students another 38 40 students is not that many where it doesn't take a lot of students to, to develop a big impact in a very small school such as Pickle Wax. Um, going from 450 to 569 students at a very small school is going to have a very big impact. And it's from students that, does, that don't live anywhere near the school. I don't think that's fair to that community. I think that's what I personally would like to see. Thank you. Ms. Abel. So I apologize for not being at the October board meeting, so I'm play playing a little catch up here. Um, the presentation that is currently on here, it says amended alternative A um, on page seven slide but it only moves 3971 and 3451 that's correct correct so the amendment that's coming later is different from this no that is the amendment those so two blocks you, <coughs> you are still splitting up quailwood and jamestown no. No. no quailwood was planned under alternative a to go to pick a and jamestown was not jamestown under alternative a stayed at summers okay so 
this change that's being proposed by the superintendent now puts Quailwin and Jamestown together, both at Pickawaxen. So the amendment is only to A, not to the original. That's correct. Part. Okay, gotcha now. So I am assuming that Quailwood is including Morgan's Ridge and Valley View. I believe so, yes. Yes. And all of that is 43 students. There was a small adjacent area the last time we looked at that that's in a different block and I don't remember that one off the top of my head. Give me a second that had 10 more students because when we talked about this at the last meeting, the number we were using then was 53 students because there's two blocks. There's the Quailwood block and there's also some stuff on Valley Road um, that was 10 more students. So the neighborhood Valley View is actually at the end of Quailwood Parkway near 225. It's actually not part of Quailwood. It's that last street. So, and also the west side of Quailwood Parkway up near Route 6 is called Morgan's Ridge. Right. So I just want to make sure that those two, if we're just saying Quailwood, we're saying both of those as well. The Morgan's Ridge was with Quailwood in the first place. Yes, that's correct. And okay. the two blocks that we talked about at the last meeting were 3441, which is the Quailwood and then 4641. 3441 had four, has 43 students from the school year 19 data. 4641 has 10 students from the- And that's actually back on Valley Road. Yes. <clears throat> okay, so I'm assuming Valley View is can, being considered as part of Quailwood. It's at the end of Quailwood Parkway. I believe it is. Yeah, we think so, yes. On two, <laughs> okay. If you um, those two blocks, the ones I just mentioned, the 3441 and the 4641, under Alternative A, were proposed to move to Pickawaxen. Okay. So now the change is based on the superintendent's recommendation to add Jamestown to that and send it to Pickawaxen with those other neighborhood components. Okay. So I would just like to echo what Mr. Hancock said. I have a very hard time moving existing neighborhoods that have gone to schools for over 30 years to make room for new development that hasn't even started yet. I would much rather see the established residents and students stay at the schools that they are originally zoned for and any new developments be sent as they are built until we can get our second, or, or not our second middle school, our new middle school built. And that's all I have to say. Thank you, Ms. Abel. Anyone else? Okay. All right. All right. Thank you. Thank you. We can take a break until four. We are ready to continue with the board. What's the will of the board? Want to keep going? Sure. Okay. What's first? Uh, students? Yep. Oh, okay. <laughs> if not, I request that the board take a vote. I'm going to sit down and make a phone call real quick. Okay. Leave a quarter on the table. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 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 he, he's, he, it's past. Can you do this one? I can only imagine what's going on out there. Hey, here we go. Here we go. Are we moving forward with recognition? That's what she's. Oh, I thought we were going to like unfinished business or something like that, and just still doing. What are we doing? We're, we're going to do the stu students, right? We can. Yeah, we're trying to see if we have students ready to go. I. If 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 not, we can move on to the next. I'm still Okay. <laughs> 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 
Okay, this is yours. Okay. Okay, we move on. We could do Eric while everybody's getting settled. Well, ne mm. next on the agenda is unfinished business. Is there any un unfinished business? No unfinished business, new business. Suspension of board policy. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm here to discuss the continuing suspension of the board policy concerning uh, fall extracurricular activity eligibility. Uh, we were as you know, waiving the board policy requiring certain standards from the uh, fourth quarter from last year for fall eligibility. And since the fall season is continuing, we're continually waive the waiving the policy through the fall season. So this is on the, uh, uh, for the board's consideration. So we could, uh, you, you would a like motion. A, a, a motion? Yes. I will entertain a motion. So moved. Moved by Mr. Lucas. Second. Second by Ms. Brown. Further discussion? Mr. Hancock. Thank you, Madam Chair. And just so that we're all clear, the first quarter has ended, correct? Correct. Thank you. Any, Mr. Hurd? Uh, I just wanted to comment on some of the feedback that I've heard from talking to students on my school visits thus far. So that's St. Charles, Westlake, and North Point High School. And I heard a lot of feedback from students about how hard the transition from four days a week to five days a week was. And the second piece of feedback I heard uh, was how a lot of these students, the only motivation they had was their sports and their activities. I know we're not voting on this now, but I think uh, in the future, I know board, some board members are opposed to it. I think it would be useful uh, to continue to waive this policy. Any further discussion? Hearing no further discussion, I will now call for a vote. Mr. Hancock? No. Ms. Brown? Yes. Mrs. McGraw? Yes. Ms. Abel? No. Mr. Lucas? Yes. Ms. Wilson votes yes. Do I, do I vote? No. Oh, I'm sorry, you do vote. I'm sorry, you do. <laughs> Mr. Yes. Yes. Motion carries? Yes. Thank you. Sorry, Thank you. Mr. Hurt. Uh, next item is future agenda items. Do we have any future agenda items? Okay. Okay. <clears throat> so, Dr. Jones. Yes. Would you do us the honor, sir? Indeed. Good evening, Board Chair Wilson, Board Members, Dr. Navarro and staff, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, this is the moment that you've been waiting for. The real reason why we are here, why we do what we do. We have assembled this evening to recognize a small sampling of the greatness we have in the young people we serve. Tonight, I'm pleased to present to you five students one at a time, who have been identified by their school principals as exemplary student models in the following areas. Academic achievement, personal responsibility, and career readiness. Students being recognized this evening are Eric Thompson, 12th grader from Robert D. Steedham Educational Center, Peyton Lewis, who we will meet momentarily, an eighth grader from Matthew Henson, Lionel Saravia, fifth grader from Daniel of St. Thomas Jennifer Elementary School, Yaretsi Alegria Hernandez, fifth grader from Daniel, I'm sorry, from Dr. Samuel A. Mudd Elementary School, 
and Samuel Bensoul, fifth grader from William B. Wade. We will begin with the recognition of Mr. Eric Thompson, and he is being recognized this evening by his school principal, Mr. Curry Workheiser. Mr. Workheiser. Good evening. Good evening. Eric Thompson is a 12th grade CTE student at the Robert D. Steedham Educational Center who uh, we wish to recognize in the area of career readiness. Uh, our esteemed student leader is currently enrolled in our HVAC program where he gets the opportunity to improve his skills by collaborating with other students in his program. Uh, he enjoys spending time in the HVAC room with his uh, teacher, Mr. Young, uh, during lunch while participating in hands-on learning. Eric uh, sees his parents as his role models and believes that hard work pays off. With that said, um, Eric just finished a three-layered interview with John Stone Supply, an HVAC company. The first was a corporate interview. The second level interview was still corporate with a regional director, after which he made it to the third round interview with a local general manager, and he got the job. This is a company with very high standards who picked up only one of our students about two years ago. Their feedback uh, to us is that Eric was a great overall candidate from the time he answered his cell phone to the time they interviewed him, they, uh, he impressed them. He responded with yes sir and no sir and ended up being everything they were looking for in a candidate. Eric is so driven that he also does landscaping work on the weekends. His uh, goal in the future is to become a member of the HVAC union and to have his own business. In addition to working two jobs, Eric, Eric manages to uh, maintain his grades and keep a healthy balance in life. And outside of work, he enjoys going fishing. <laughs> Eric Thompson is truly a pleasure to have in our building. It's my honor to nominate him for this board recognition. Wow, thank you. Oh, wow. All right, congratulations to you, Mr. Thompson. At so this time as well, so I'm going to turn Eric, it over. Eric, on behalf of the Charles County Board of Education, job well done. It is absolutely exciting to celebrate uh, your success publicly before your family and your friends and your classmates. And you highlight that there are a lot of great things that are going on at Steedham. Uh, I'm kind of, I will tell you, I have a little bit of disappointment because I was, now that I know that you have a job, I was about to say, I have a job for you, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you're so overqualified that you, they've already stolen uh, you from us. So keep up the good work, um, and we wish you nothing but the very best, and we're very proud of you, and I'm sure that your loved ones, I think with the Dallas Cowboy fan in, in the back, <laughs> And the, and the cameras are very proud, proud of you and your classmates as well. Thanks. So at this time, would you like to have a moment to share your thoughts with us? I want to thank my principal for giving me, you know, this opportunity to, you know, get the award. I want to thank my parents for always being on me. Anytime, <laughs> you know, I'm being distracted, they always on me. So I just want to thank, really want to thank them. Yep. Thank you, mom and dad. Good job. Good job. <laughs> So thank you and keep up the good work and we look forward to um, and, uh, seeing your company being the top yes, top 100 in the state of Maryland for HVAC, okay? Yes ma'am, you will, right. you definitely will. Are we doing pictures? Yeah. Yes. Thank you. 
And congratulations once again to Eric and his family. We will now welcome to the front of the room our next recipient. I believe him and his principal are making their way. Peyton Lewis, eighth grader from Matthew Henson Middle School. Peyton Lewis, please report to the front of the room. <laughs> yes, there he is. All right. And he will be introduced by his school principal, Ms. Christina Caballero from Matthew Henson. Ms. Caballero. Good evening. Um, Peyton never gets called to the front of the room. Um, very, <laughs> very soft spoken. Um, uh, but I would like to recognize Peyton Lewis, who is an eighth grader at Matthew Henson, for academic achievement. Peyton has maintained a straight A average through sixth and seventh grade, and he is actually on track to receive straight A's in eighth grade as well. Um, he actually has received letter grades since kindergarten um, because he came to us from the state of Arizona, and in, in, in Arizona, you, learn, you earn letter grades. So he has had straight A's since kindergarten. Um, I don't think I can even say that. Um, Peyton is an active member of Matthew Henson Middle School, participating in Lego Robotics, NJHS, and our golf team, which took third place this year. Outside of school, Peyton is a first-class scout and gives back to the Charles County community in many ways. Most recently, Peyton has planted trees in recognition of 9-11, collected food for Charles County food banks, assisted with the collection of baby supplies for local charities, and has participated in river cleanup efforts. Peyton aspires to take on additional leadership role in the Scouts and hopes to become an Eagle Scout. After high school, he plans to attend a university and study engineering. Peyton's teachers describe him as polite, respectful, smart, and hardworking. Matthew Henson Middle School is very proud of, to have Peyton receive this well-deserved recognition. Congratulations, Peyton. Thank you, Ms. Caballero. And Peyton, congratulations once again. And Ms. Wilson? Pey please. Peyton, welcome. Um, it is a pleasure to meet you in person. You have quite an impressive resume for such a young person. <laughs> the community projects that you've already achieved, I'm, I'm tired just th thinking about it. Uh, keep up the good work. Um, I have to tell you, uh, often we get your bio in advance and it's very impressive. And the fact that you are a first um, class scout, I happen to look up the requirements for a first class scout. Says a lot about you, young man, but all the things that you had to do in order to get that designation. And then wanting to be an Eagle Scout, I am very confident that you will achieve that, that status. Um, could you share with us what motivates you to do so much for the community? Um, uh, I don't really know. <laughs> you're, just, you're just a quiet, motivating person, huh? Well, you keep up the good work. We're very proud of you, and it is a pleasure to meet you. But I'd like to give you an opportunity to say thank you or say a few words if you have any um, family or friends here. I would just like to thank my principal, my teachers, and my parents. Okay. All right. Well, keep up the good work. It shows that qu even quiet folks can achieve a lot, <laughs> a lot. So keep up the good work. It's a pleasure to meet you. Thank you so much. Welcome to the front of the room, our next recipient, our next exemplary student model coming all the way from Daniel of St. Thomas Jennifer Elementary School. I'm sure making his way this direction any time now. Oh yeah, yeah. here we go. Lionel Saravia, Lionel Saravia is here, please have a seat young man. And Mr. Saravia will be recognized this evening by his school principal, Mr. Kevin Jackson from Jennifer Elementary School. Mr. Jackson. Thank you. 
Good afternoon once again. On behalf of the staff and, and the students at Jennifer Elementary School, we would like to recognize Lionel Saravia for academic achievement. Lionel takes the opportunity every single day to make the mission possible, as we say at Jennifer Elementary School. He is a definite uh, example of excellence uh, at uh, Jennifer, and he shows us every single day what leadership is like. Jennifer is recognizing him as a fifth grade student in the area of academic achievement. His fifth grade teacher, Mrs. Correll, shared the following information. Lionel is a well-rounded and intelligent student that performs well in all subject areas. He does his best to understand the information being taught. He often adds valuable information to our class discussions. He has a pleasant personality, and it shows through his many peer friendships. His friends look up to him as a great friend and leader. Lionel has many other attributes. Lionel was recognized as a fourth grade champion at the February 2021 Winter Chess Tournament. He was a member of the fourth grade math team at Jennifer on last year. Lionel is also active in our school's band. He plays percussion well. Lionel receives instruction in the areas of gifted and talented education. He has earned straight A's in all areas in grades three and four. The staff and students at Jennifer are proud to recognize him as an excellent example of the team Mission Possible spirit. I present to you Lionel Sadovia. And Mr. Sadovia, I said it wrong. You should have corrected me. Sadovia, is that right? All right, very it's well. close. It's real. So okay. Lionel, it is a pleasure to meet you, and congratulations. You have a very impressive resume. Uh, I have to ask, you're a chess tournament champion. How long you been playing chess? Uh, around almost three years. Almost three years. Do you think you're going to continue to keep playing? And yeah. you know, if you're if you're one of those serious chess players, you get ratings. Do you think you aspire to do that? Yeah. I I also uh, why I got the championship is because uh like. Recently, I have, I have been playing against adults. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> Ooh, me. I, oh. it, in a tournament that my chess teacher have, has recommended me, and uh, I did lose, but as they all say, losing helps you learn. There you go. <laughs> there you go. All right. I am inquisitive. You you play the drums, correct? Yes. Do you play the drums at home? Uh, no, but <laughs> but uh, I I I've seen a movie and I like the movie very well, so I want to play like the person in the movie. Okay, all right. Will you keep up the good work? I want to give you an opportunity to speak. Do you, any anybody you like to? Give a shout out to or thank. I like to thank my principal for shouting me out <laughs> for the whole entire school and choosing me as the one student. And my teacher, my parents. I'm mom and dad. <laughs> and my friends uh, that live in my neighborhood. And they also helped me play soccer, which I, I also play soccer and they, they helped me do that. Okay, well you keep up the good work. We expect bigger and better things from you. You take, you do, you do, you've done an exceptional job. Thank you. Thank you.
right, and our next exemplary student to be recognized this evening is Yuretsi Alegria Hernandez, fifth grader from De <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> I've been working on that. <laughs> fifth grader from De Dr. Samuel A. Mudd Elementary School, being recognized by her principal, Ms. Orlena Wild. Good evening. It is my honor to introduce Yaretsi Alegria Hernandez, a fifth grade student at Dr. Mudd Elementary School. Rob Waldrop once said that a person's life is immeasurably enriched by taking personal responsibility to do what you can with what they have and where they are. This is the growth mindset that Yaretsi has every day and she brings that mindset to Dr. Mudd as she enters the hallways. Yoretti is currently a fifth grade student and is being recognized in the area of personal responsibility. Yoretti is a positive role model who leads by example. Since her days in pre-kindergarten, Yoretti believes in setting an example for other students to follow by working to the best of her ability each and every day. She has a clear goal in mind and strives to achieve it. As a role model for others, Yoretti goes out of her way to assist other students and her teachers. She completes every task on time and goes above and beyond expectations on all of her assignments and at-home projects. Ms. Green, Yoretsi's fifth grade teacher shared, it is an honor having Yoretsi in my class. She is a true definition of a student leader. She upholds the three R's each day and she strives to make our classroom a better place for all those with her kind words and meaningful interactions with her peers. If a student or I need help, Yoretsi is always offering or willing to assist. Mr. Yake, another staff member at Dr. Mudd shared, Yoretsi is a joy to have in my classroom. She brings out the best in me as a teacher. Even through the pandemic, Yoretsi persevered to ensure she remained focused on her goals. While the pandemic was a challenge, as Yoretsi stated, she maintained her grades, earning principal's honor roll each quarter, and maintained all threes in personal responsibility. In addition to being a well-rounded student, Yoresi is also involved in several school activities, such as our Destination Imagination Team and Band, where she currently plays the flute. Outside of school, you can find Yoresi reading, drawing, riding her bike, and spending time with her family. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you Yoresi Alegria Hernandez, Dr. Mudd's exemplary student. Congratulations again, Yuretsi. Yes, and at this time, Ms. Wilson, I'm going to turn it back over to you. Okay. So, Yuretsi, welcome to the Charles County Board of Education. It's a pleasure meeting you. And thank you for coming here and celebrating uh, your achievements. You have a very impressive resume, um, and you seem to be a very busy young lady. What do you do for fun? <laughs> well, I'm right now I'm trying to join the Girls Who Code Club. And like, usually at home, I, may, I read, I help my brother, you know, on his homework, because I also want him to one day be like here, right here, getting recognized by something. Um, and I also like to like, be, I like to be active, so I mostly spend time playing outside with my friends. Okay. Have you given any thought what do you want to do after you graduate from school? Mm, well, I want it right now, I want to be a psychiatrist. But yeah. I also wanted to be a teacher, but I'm mostly like I want to be more a psychiatrist. So. <laughs> well, I'm confident that, that no matter what you choose, you're going to do extremely well. So you keep up the good work and continue to make us proud. I'll give you an opportunity to to speak if you like. Uh, I want to say thank you to my mom and dad for always encouraging me to do my best. Thank you uh, to Ms. Watley and Ms. Soderstrom and all of my teachers at Dr. Mudd for re recognizing me in personal responsibility and honoring me as the exemplary, exemplary student. You have all helped me be the best student I can be. You have always done good things for Dr. Mudd students. Dr. Mudd is the best school. I always feel safe and encouraged to learn more every day. I'll miss you all when I go to middle school. I know that I will be prepared when I leave Dr. Mudd Elementary School. Thank you again for this honor. Congratulations. Is that, mom and dad, is that mom and dad in the background? Can you st st wave at them so they take a, a good picture? You could go to the front of the stage. We'll yeah. 
All right, and our last but not least recipient this evening comes from Wade Elementary School. This is young Mr. Samuel Benso, fifth grader at Wade Elementary, being introduced by his principal, Mr. Bill Miller. Mr. Miller. Good evening. Samuel is a fifth grade student at William B. Wade Elementary School and is being recognized in the area of academic success. Samuel has been a very proud Wildcat since he's in kindergarten. <laughs> if you talk to any one of his teachers, they'll say Samuel is a very dedicated and hardworking student. Sam will do any, anything for anybody at any time. Sam is the kind of student that puts 100% of himself into any project that he takes on and is not fully satisfied until it is done to the best of his abilities. His fourth grade teacher, Ms. Brock, talked about Sam by saying, he is an amazing student. During distance learning, Sam showed leadership skills by participating in class discussions, helping his peers uh, when working with groups and breakout rooms. I was thankful to have Sam in my class because he even helped me with any technology issues I was having. <laughs> Sam is the kind of student leader that any teacher would love to have in his class. Ms. Marty, his current fifth grade teacher, describes Samuel as polite, respectful, and a hardworking student. He conscientiously and deliberately always strives to do his best. He's eager to learn and has excellent participation in class. He's very responsible and consistently puts forth his best effort to succeed academically. His classmates and I appreciate his positive attitude and consideration for others. He is a true leader and role model for his peers and school community. Sam is con considering pursuing a career in the chemistry field and wants to be a chemist. When I asked him why he was pursuing this career choice, he simply responded, I thought about engineering, but I think chemistry is pretty cool. <laughs> Samuel has a great perspective on school. When we were talking, Samuel said he loves being a wildcat because learning and school in general is fun and I get to hang out with my friends all day. <laughs> Whether Samuel decides to, decides to do as he, what he decides to do as he progresses through school, I know that his family and society will benefit from his hard work and dedication to improve himself and others. When Samuel is not impressing everyone with his academic abilities or his award-winning personality, which you'll get to see in a little bit, <laughs> you may hear him playing his saxophone, working with the math team, playing chess, or find him around the school just being an active safety patrol member. Outside of the school, Samuel enjoys playing soccer and is excited about starting lacrosse, being with his friends and family, and messing around on the computer. In the wintertime, you also might be able to find him shredding up the mountainside, either skiing or snowboarding. And if you're lucky enough, because he's a very busy individual, <laughs> In the summer, you might see him training for his next triathlon. And I about fell out of my chair when he said he did two triathlons already. Hi. So on behalf of William B. Wade Elementary, I'm very proud to present Mr. Samuel Benson. All right, saxophone player, you had me at hello. <laughs> All right, this is Mr. Samuel Benson, Ms. Wilson. I'm Samuel, wow, what an impressive resume. You play the saxophone? Are you, 
if any particular genre of music that you prefer, you're a jack or you're a jack of all trades. No, no, you're work you're working on it. Is as far as the triathlon is concerned, is there a particular one that's coming up that you're interested in, or you just tra you're just training in in general? Just training in general. Just training in general. Where do you where do you find the time to do safety patrol and training for triathlons and tearing up the mountainside? Well, I train in the summer, and in the winter I will ski and snowboard. And then whenever I'm at school, I'll just do some my safety patrol duties. Did he get? Did you get a chance to ski this past season? Yes. And where at? Um, Whitetail in Pennsylvania. Okay. All right. And, and you, how about is it? What is it? Snowboarding? You did that as well. You, mm -hmm. Do you have a preference between skiing or snowboarding, mm -hmm. or does it make a difference? Well, you be safe, and you can <laughs> you continue to keep up the great job that you're doing and is I'll give you an opportunity to say a thank you or um, a shout out to anyone that you like to acknowledge. Mm -hmm. uh, I would like to thank my parents for guiding me in the right spot and all my teachers and friends for helping me out. Okay. Well congratulations again. Mm -hmm. We have a small gift to give to present to you. You can stand and move right up to the middle. Yes. And get ready for your picture. There you go. Excuse me. You're fun. All right, and this will conclude the student recognition portion for this evening. But we will now invite to the microphone our human resources supervisor, Ms. Charlene Ogburn, who will introduce our exemplary employees for the evening. Ms. Ogburn, please. Thank you, Dr. Jones. Good evening, Chairperson Wilson, Superintendent Dr. Navarro, Board members, executive staff, colleagues, friends, and family. Again, my name is Charlene Ogburn. I am in the Office of Human Resources, and today we be, will be acknowledging five exemplary employees. Our first recipient will be Mr. Todd Wagaman <coughs> from Robert D. Steatham Educational Center. Our next employee will be Mr. Andrew Schoenberg from da Daniel of St. Thomas Jennifer Elementary School. Our next employee will be Ms. Leah Flynn from Samuel A. Mudd Elementary School. And our final employee will be Ms. Alicia Sweat from William B. May Wade Elementary School. And now, help us to receive our first recipient, Mr. Todd Wagaman, a rehabilitative teacher from Robert D. Steatham Edu Element Educational Center presented by Principal Curry Workheiser. Uh, good, evening. good evening. Make sure I'm on here. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes. Okay, wonderful. It gives me great uh, pleasure to introduce you to a leader, a mentor, a listener, an exemplary educator. Mr. Todd Wagaman is Robert D. Steedham Educational Center's re uh, physical rehabilitation teacher who successfully built the program on our campus five years ago. As a leader, Mr. Wagaman has taken on the role of the uh, career and technology team lead this year. 
He works well with the team and consistently provides guidance and, membership and mentorship to others, uh, thus creating a positive culture at uh, Robert D. Steedham. To ensure that he provides the best education for his students, Mr. Wagaman played a role in the development of the uh, physical rehabilitation curriculum as part of the MSDE cur curriculum design team and continues to stay active in his professional community. Additionally, he's uh, completing his Master's of Education in CTE and believes that learning is a lifelong process. As a result, he finds creative ways to engage and reach his diverse population using hands-on learning. You'll observe his students doing things like dissecting organs, diagnosing disorders, or performing man manipulations while showing off their acquired skills. He utilizes a balance of lecture, hands-on work and technology to increase the effectiveness of his instruction. In 2020, Mr. Wagaman volunteered to pilot new virtual technology and teaching methods as instruction shifted to a hybrid teaching model due to the COVID pandemic. He, as well as his class, uh, was, in, was front and center for demonstrations of hybrid teaching and virtual tool, tools that were ultimately adopted by the Board of Education and implemented countywide. You might have seen him in a video that we uh, put out uh, in, in that year uh, in front of his students. So in closing, I would like to uh, publicly thank and recognize Mr. Wagaman for his continued efforts and accomplishments and contributions to the success of students at the Robert D. Steedham Educational Center. Mr. Wagaman, it is our pleasure um, uh, to acknowledge your achievement today. You're one of those individuals that a lot of times does so much work behind the scenes and we don't get to see you publicly and here we are recognizing your achievement. So thank you for what you do every day. This is also um, a great example of another great program at Steedham and I would like to use this opportunity to, to let, allow you to share, the phys to talk a little bit about the physical rehab program, because that is huge. Oh, I mean, yes. we have a physical rehab program in Charles County, and it's, it's a gem. And would you share with the public? Uh, yes, ma'am, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, thank you, Mr. Workheiser, uh, and the school administration, thank you board members for uh, recognizing that. Um, so without getting into too many details, essentially our um, physical rehabilitation program, just like other programs at Steedham, is a two-year program. We have juniors and seniors in high school. Um, so for my particular program, we specialize in uh, medicine, physical medicine specifically, where uh, junior year goes through many of the body systems in general medicine, illnesses, uh, contagious infections, None more prevalent, uh, as we know, as the current one, right? Um, so we go through our general medicine diagnoses, treatments, uh, body systems, and so on. Um, the senior year, much like many of our other programs, we specialize um, where we are going to look at physical medicine, physical therapy, um, athletic training, occupational therapy, where we actually get to utilize, um, in addition to our junior year, our first years, they actually get to utilize hands-on equipment where we are manipulating actual human beings, um, where we will diagnose, treat, and rehabilitate actual humans. Um, I have lots of staff members that are more than willing to be models for my students. <laughs> if you are in the area and have uh, some time, please stop by. Um, we will, on a regular basis, stop a lecture for us to have uh, an example. Um, so I invite you, please come through. Hands on experience. Ma'am, hands, hands on, on experience. experience. Absolutely, right? So, um, but that is the basis of the program. Um, so my students are looking to be orthopedics, um, orthopedic surgeons, orthopedic physicians, uh, physical therapists. I have lots of um, nurse practitioners and physician assistants, or future nurse practitioners and, and physician assistants. But that's the basis of the program is physical medicine. Um, we also have an internship uh, aspect to it as well uh, as seniors, where they are out in the community twice a week, where uh, I do not see them. They actually will go out to uh, medical and uh, fitness facilities throughout the county. Uh, so they do that from October through April um, as part of the program. And again, without getting into too many 
organ dissection discussions. Um, that is the basis of our program. We very much appreciate all your hard work and your dedication and continue to keep up the, the good work. So Thank you very much. Uh, would you like to uh, acknowledge anyone? I, well, again, the, the two big groups here are, you know, uh, county administration, board members, <coughs> school administration. Uh, again, for support, uh, we wouldn't have this program if uh, we wouldn't have been given the opportunity to have this program uh, five years ago. So um, the fact that we were allowed to even explore this particular opportunity has provided um, a, another avenue for our future medical students. So thank you very much for for everybody involved. Well, thank you and congratulations. Thank you very much. Andrew Schaumburg, an elementary science teacher from Daniel of St. Thomas Elementary School, presented by Principal Kevin Jackson, Sr. Good afternoon again. On behalf of the administration and staff at Jennifer Elementary School, I recognize our science teacher, Andy Schambarger, for, for our employee recognition. Mrs. Schambarger cares and is committed to the education process. He is an advocate for teachers and administrators' rights as expressed in the EACC contract. He is positively active outside of the classroom in numerous ways. I will provide you just a few examples. Mrs. Schambarger has been has, been, has, has keen insight to how parts go together to impact the whole. He used this skill masterfully at the beginning of this school year to support the school administration to design this year's master schedule. He willingly uh, sits and offers advice or support to the school administration in any way that he can, as well as his colleagues. Mr. Schambarger anticipates always the specific needs as relates to uh, safety at Jennifer. That includes the arrival and dismissal process. He is always sharing ideas about how it can be uh, better uh, in enabled to make sure that all students and staff, including parents, are safe. He shares these ideas and thoughts with the school administration in many ways. Andy is also willing to share ideas related to technology as it relates to resources and survey links. He was inv invaluable last year during the online learning and offered uh, many times to unlock doors for puzzles that we could not figure out. We also recognized last year uh, Mr. Schambarger as a Smeckle Science Teacher of the Year. However, Mr. Schambarger, in his, in his great fashion, uh, declined the nomination at that time uh, to focus in on teaching his children and to serve uh, them in the best way possible. Mr. Schambarger works diligently throughout the day and even after school. He has provided after school instruction in the area of robotics. He also teaches the science standards in an engaging way. It is always a pleasure to go in his classroom and see the active learning that his students do on a daily basis. He makes it relevant to them so that they understand exactly what the standard is. He asks appropriate questions that promote rigor and that cause children to think. His feedback to his students causes them to reflect so that they get closer to the target for learning. Mr. Schambarger supports teaching and learning at Jennifer in whatever capacity he can. He supports the school administration in whatever capacity necessary, and he is committed to adding to his learning in the area of science and overall instruction. Mr. Schambarger also serves as the EACC rep at Jennifer and has done so for many, many years. Mr. Schambarger always communicates with the administration in a professional manner, and he always uh, will bring up 
uh, points of possible contention coming from the staff in a, in a very eloquent way to cause the administration to kind of rethink certain things. But also, he also goes back to uh, his colleagues and also gets them to think differently as well. So I present to you Andy Schambarger as Jennifer's candidate for employee recognition. So Mr. Schambarger, thank you and congratulations. Well, thank you for all that you do. Uh, it sounds like you are a jack of all, all trades. Um, and we, we really appreciate your hard work and your commitment. And it's always an honor to recognize you, yes, put the camera on, on you and to celebrate your success and you're the reason why our children thrive. I am curious to know, as a science teacher, you, you seem to be the type of teacher that, let's say, provides some very interesting instruction. Can you, can you give an example of a class that you have given um, that you s seem to really stimulate the kids. I mean, um, it may have shocked your principal in the process. <laughs> well, I don't know that I shocked the principal uh, in this one, but um, just uh, what last week, over the last couple weeks that we've been working on, um, really focusing on different kinds of observational skills in fifth grade and making sure that we're working with our qualitative and quantitative um, observations. And one of the big projects we do is uh, refining some of our skills through our procedures and making Play-Doh. Well, they start out with really, really not great Play-Doh that I end up making for them. <laughs> and we look at that process and we refine the different qualitative measurements of it. Is it too dry? Is it too wet? Is it too grainy? And then they look at what ingredients we had and what the properties of those are and they get to choose how to change their own formula. And I will say, while this was a mess of a lesson, the kids really enjoyed it. And um, by the end, I'm not the type of teacher that's going to let them take Play-Doh back to their classroom. <laughs> they were very upset that I was making them get rid of it. So, um, yeah. So why am I not surprised that that, that was the, the outcome? But it demonstrates your commitment for making learning the learning experience exciting for our kids. So thank you for what you do. And, and what you will continue to do. Is there anyone that you would like to thank? Or? Um, just really quickly, uh, uh, I really want to take this opportunity to acknowledge uh, the continued efforts of all of our Jennifer staff, units one, two, three, and four. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge our non-CCPS CCPS employees, uh, such as our amazing, amazing SLP bus drivers, school nurses, SROs, and our school uh, volunteers and substitutes. Um, during what has been a very trying experience recently. Um, I just, their combined efforts have made every day possible. So thank you again and keep up the good work and we have a small gift to present to you. employee is Miss Leah Flynn, a pre-kindergarten instructional assistant from Dr. Samuel A. Mudd Elementary School, presented by Principal Orlena Watley. Take a deep breath. Good evening again. It is my pleasure to introduce Ms. Leah Flynn Hallman. Leah has been serving as an instructional assistant at Dr. Mudd for 19 years. Throughout her tenure, she has been a dedicated and valued member of our school family who seeks to build relationships and make connections to both students and staff. At the center of her work are our students. 
Their best interest is at the heart of who she is and everything she does. Her goal is to remove barriers so that others can be their best and they can thrive. This means if students need supplies, she ensures that they have them. If staff need resources, you can see her delivering them uh, to their rooms. She gives unselfishly of herself and never asks for anything in return. Leah is revered by the staff and the families we serve. She oversees our Sunshine Committee, making it a point to connect with our staff to see if there is a need and pays it forward by sprinkling kindness, empathy, and gratitude to everyone she encounters. Her dedication to the students and to the staff goes unmatched. Ms. Blaine Holman's colleagues hold her in the highest regard and the children love her. I speak with many pre-K parents and their remarks are the same when speaking about Ms. Leah. They speak with someone who is caring, kind, and considerate. They believe she is planting seeds and watching them grow in our community in which she calls home also in her effort to serve the students. She believes in our students and paving a positive path for them to reach their goals. Ms. Hallman is a role model for other instructional assistants and is often helping them navigate through the system as a source of support. Again, she pays it forward because that is who she is. If you ask Ms. Flynn Hallman why she dedicates so much time to learning about our families, helping others, and giving so much of herself, she will simply state, our staff and families deserve nothing less. This is who she is. She is a consummate professional. There is no task too big or too small that she is unwilling to undertake in order to improve the educational setting and environment for our students and staff. She believes in servant leadership, silent leadership. She's a quiet storm. If anything needs to happen, she's behind the scenes making it happen. That is her purpose in life, is to serve and assist others. Again, I present to you Dr. Mudd's exemplary employee, Ms. Leah Flynn Hallman. Thank you so much, Ms. Ms. Uh, Flynn. I, we appreciate um, the, the opportunity to recognize you publicly because I know when you're in, your, in the classroom, you are working so hard, and you're, it's obvious that you are a committed and dedicated individual. Thank you for sprinkling your kindness. Would you share with us some of the activities that you have organized under the Sunshine Committee? Because that is, excuse the expression, I say this very respectfully, is old school. But... <laughs> But it, it brings a smile uh, to everyone's face, and I'm confident that you bring a lot of smiles to a lot of pre-Kers. But so could you share with us some um, of so your... Recently, we um, had a wedding shower for one of our staff members, and we're planning another one for April. We've done um, some baby showers. We've organized some potlucks where we've had staff bring in, um, this was pre-COVID, bring in... Um, potluck items for our entire staff. We had a pie day one year when we were in the transition school. We had um, pizzas and pies brought in um, for the staff. Um, we had do retirement. We do, we were actually working now to do um, just something for the staff, um, just because we know it's been a tough year. So we're kind of in the process of that. We're also looking at um, having bi-monthly cakes for birthdays. Um, we recently celebrated Ms. Lotley as a staff for um, Principals Month. So we just do, a, we just kind of come up with ideas that incorporate the whole staff that kind of are like, oh, this is what we needed. <laughs> so. so on top of all of, of, of all of that, you're running around with these pre-K pre pre students. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And, and all the list of other things that you contribute to your school. So thank you for what you do. We know it's hard work and, and it's well-deserved. Would, would you like to take a moment to Thank uh, some folks. Thank you. Good afternoon, members of the Board of Education, Dr. Navarro, and guests. It is truly an honor to be recognized as Dr. Mudd exemplary employee. I would first like to thank the Board of Education for championing early childhood education. The students in my pre-K class will be the future class of 2035. Mm. And, I, and I did the math. <laughs> <laughs> I am so proud that I have had a hand in building their foundation in school. 
I would also like to thank my principal, Orlena Watley. She sets high expectations and is always a positive role model for staff and students. In addition, Ms. Wadley instills in all of our staff that we are not just instructional assistants and teachers. We are all vital members of Dr. Mudd's community. I thank you as well to my vice principal, Shella Soderstrom, for always offering encouraging words and support. And to all the staff members at Dr. Mudd, thank you for helping me make our school feel safe and supportive for everyone who walks through the door. And lastly, thank you to my family, who are my motivation and inspiration to keep teaching our future leaders. All five of my kids went to Dr. Mudd, so. <laughs> Again, thank you for this honor. Well, thank you and congratulations. exemplary employee is near and dear to my heart because she is my niece, who of which I am very proud to say, Miss Alicia, a secretary from William B. Wade Elementary School, will be presented by her principal, William Miller. All right. Well, it's with great pride I present to you Miss Alicia Sweat. Alicia is our front office administrative assistant that helps keep Wade running efficiently and smoothly throughout our very, very busy days. Alicia earned her political science degree from Salisbury University and is currently working on obtaining her master's degree in psychology. After obtaining her master's degree, Hopefully she changes her mind because we don't want to lose her. She hopes to start her own nonprofit youth mentor program. When I asked her about why she wants to start her own nonprofit, her response was simple. I feel like I can relate to kids. I love to help them talk through any problems they might be having, or if they're upset about something, I just love being there for the kids. To say Alicia's worked her way up the career ladder would be an understatement. She began her uh, time with CCPS as a temporary assistant at Central Office, then became an instructional assistant at the Gwynn Center, and transferred to student services, <coughs> and thankfully landed at Wade <laughs> Elementary. Alicia's not your ordinary employee. She goes above and beyond without having to be asked to lend a hand wherever it is needed around the school. She helps organize all the substitutes in the morning to make sure all the classes are covered. When things change with substitutes, she presents the problem, but she's excellent. She always has a solution to that problem. So I appreciate her very much for that. Whenever we're shorthanded, she is the first person to volunteer to assist anywhere it is needed. Whenever anyone comes into the front office, they are greeted with a warm hello and are always looked after with respect and grace. Both the students and parents, parents appreciate all of the help and support she provides. Where Alicia's experience really paid off, uh, the most was through virtual learning. She was our primary help desk technician. She took it upon herself to learn how to troubleshoot many of the issues that the parents were having. She was assisting parents and teachers with many of the technology issues that they were facing. She assisted countless numbers of parents, students, and teachers throughout the very long virtual year. 
What I appreciate the most about Alicia is her ability to connect with our students and help them work through their situations. Oftentimes, administrators or the school counselors are occupied doing other things. A student might show up in the front office having a problem, and their problems seem to go away while they're talking with Ms. Sweat. Um, as an administrator, when I go down to check on the student, they'll say, Mr. Miller, it's okay. I talked with Ms. Sweat. <laughs> she <laughs> I can't thank her enough for that, and neither can the parents. Um, words cannot express how much our Wade family appreciates Alicia and all that she does for everyone. She's a role model for our students and our young staff members. It's my honor to present Ms. Alicia Sweat as William B. Wade's outstanding employee. So, Ms. Wett, not only are we proud of you, but obviously your aunt is very <laughs> pr proud of you. And we're very thankful to have such a professional uh, in, in our mess. I am confident some way, somehow, we can convince you to, to <laughs> reach your goals and to continue to work for Charles County Public Schools. Mm -hmm. you, you've built quite a resume. Um, would you share with us um, you know, the challenges of the last 18 months and 19 months, you, you seem to, to have helped in so many different ways. Would you share with us some, your thoughts of how we got through it or how you helped others get through it? Um, it definitely was an adjustment for everyone, but like, I just knew that I had to do what I could to relieve some of the stress off of like admin, our computer tech, um, as well as the parents who were trying to figure out how to go through virtual learning. So I didn't mind looking up whatever I needed to look up for them or figuring out on my own so that I can assist them. So I definitely don't mind stepping in because it's been a lot on everyone. So that's... You you know, you just never know. You, you continue to work for Charles County Public Schools, you might become the superintendent of schools. You just don't know. So in any capacity um, that you serve, I know that you will serve children very well. So we wish you your continued success. Thank At you. this time, would you like to thank anyone or share any further thoughts? I would just like to thank my uh, principal for all the kind words. I would like to thank my wonderful Wade staff for always um, helping me and always being um, great to work with, and my lovely aunt for always encouraging me to push myself, so thank you. Well, thank you. Keep up the good work, and we will do our very best to retain you. <laughs> <laughs> Employee employees, another round of applause. Thank you, and now I'll turn it back over to you, Chairperson Wilson. Uh, at this time, uh, next on the agenda is the public forum. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Dr. Navarro? If No, we cannot. Okay. So we we will go on break. Yeah. Can we can we return five minutes before, please? Mm -hmm. Sure. If you say so. It's six o'clock. Dr. Navarro, we're good. Yes. Okay. Paul, welcome back everyone. We'll reconvene the Board of Education meeting, starting with the public forum.
I will read the rules for public forum. Statements should, uh, speakers should identify themselves. Statements should be brief to the point and limited to three minutes or less. Board members should not be expected to respond during the forum to statements made by speakers. Statements should relate to Charles County Board of Education agenda items or any education related topic with the following limitations. Personnel matters pending or potential appeals or the comments regarding the actions or statements of individual staff or the private lives of any individual are not appropriate topics. Proper language and decorum are required at all times. We have speakers in person and virtual this evening. Our first in person speaker is Dawn Richardson. Our next speaker is Vontasha Sims. Hello, everyone. Hello. Yes, hello everyone, good evening. Um, my name is Vontasha Sims. I just to introduce myself. Um, I'm a resident here of Charles County. Um, I'm also a community serv servant here in Charles County as well, as well as involved with many different political organizations, activist groups, legislative groups, and et cetera. Uh, I guess I just wanna basically formally introduce myself to uh, Dr. Navarro here. Uh, welcome to Charles County. Uh, in case you don't officially know me, me uh, I'm just here basically for not only myself as a parent, but also as someone who's actively involved in the community. Just a few issues that I want to speak about in regards to Charles County Public Schools. We want to talk about when it comes to the education of our children, we want to make sure that we are striving for excellence here in Charles County. When it comes to community engagement, when it comes to our curriculum, when it comes to even, excuse me, <clears throat> assisting our communities and our families through this terrible COVID period, which has been hard on each and every family member, on each and every one of us in this community. So we wanna make sure we are being community engaged in this community and really helping to support and bring this community together. So I just want you guys to know that I do come in peace. I am here to support you fully in your ventures and make sure that we are moving Charles County forward. Also, when it comes to things like um, our community schoolings, we want to have schools that's involving our communities in a major way. We want to be able to engage our communities, engage our families, engage our students in a positive way to work towards excellence here in Charles County. We want an, an inclusive community here. We want to know how this, this board is reaching out across the board to our communities to involve and engage our students in a positive way. We also wanna make sure that we're providing a place of public health and safety for our children, not only on their school buses, but also within the school system itself. We wanna make sure that our, our schools, whether they're being new, newly built schools or schools that are already in existence, to make sure they are properly renovated, to make sure we are have properly circulating system, proper air purif purification systems in those schools, and we're properly having sanitation, sanitation devices that are readily available for our teachers, our students, our bus drivers, and those who may be in need in the community. No students should be coming to school without the proper necessary protective gear that they need. No teacher should be coming to school without the protective gear that they need. We also wanna talk about mental health and wellness. Uh, in case Dr. Navarro, Navarro, uh, Navarro, in case you don't know me, I'm a very big mental health and wellness advocate here in Charles County. We wanna provide a space, a safe place for our children to be able to vent their frustrations, to vent their concerns, a place where they can safely go where they may not have anyone else to talk to, a safe place where they can try to seek resources to not only empower them, but empower their community and to empower their, their family as well. We wanna also talk about renewable energy when it comes to our school systems, to our school buses as well, uh, let alone the conflict that's going on with our bus drivers here in Charles County. Let me just make a brief note on that. I would love to see the school board make some kind of resolution to come to a positive conclusion uh, in that regard as well. We want safe jobs here, we want sustainable jobs here, we want families who would actually live here, raise their children here, work here in Charles County, and retire right here in Charles County. So uh, once again, I don't want to take up too much of your time, but just please know that I'm here to support you all, and please let's remember that actually this board, these board members are actually elected officials here in Charles County. You are up for re-election in 2022. And not only do I want you to hold me electable, uh, me accountable for my position, we also want to make sure that you are accountable in the roles that you play because education is our number one concern throughout the community. So thank you for your time. Thank Have you. Have a great day. Thank you.
My name is Melissa Carpenter. I am a lifelong resident of Charles County, a graduate of CCPS, as well as a teacher here. I am once again here to share from the viewpoint of a teacher. I wish I could have watched today's Board of Ed meeting, but I was unfortunately teaching. Not unfortunately, but I was teaching. I did get the chance to catch up on last month's. And while catching up on, of course, grading and other things after work hours, <laughs> uh, I appreciate all of the thanks and support and understanding each of you showed in your comments for not only educators, but everyone in the schools. While the appreciation is great, we need the next step. We urgently need help. Last month, I had two educator colleagues resign with what I thought was only one more on the way. The counts changed again. Four educators have now resigned. Four, four connections to my classroom that affect my students. We need help. The workload is massive. And while I appreciate your attempt to help by canceling school on November 12th, you really only shifted it from a work day to a choice unpaid work day. We didn't ask for a day off. We need a day to do our jobs. November 12th for many will still end up being work. We just won't get credit for it. So I'll make it clear. We need more planning time. We need more time to collaborate with colleagues, not in county mandated PDs run by outside vendors, not sessions on self-care or resetting. We need time to do our jobs. If you want to offer these others as optional, great. Last month, it was amazing to hear about all the accolades CCPS is receiving across the state. How incredible would it be for CCPS to also be the leaders in, plan in valuing teacher planning time? Building communities of educators who are education professionals and can manage themselves and growing student achievement through these priorities. Because at the end of the day, this is all for our students. We have the people in this room to make that happen. We can do this. We need to do this. Because what I don't want Charles County to be known for is having an educator of retention issue. Being the county that educators don't feel respected in. Or the county with the least student success. As I said before, I hope this starts the conversation with teachers and not about us. Thank you. Next speaker is Tina Osborne. Good evening, members of the board. My name is Tina Osborne. My daughter is a third grader at J.P. Ryan Elementary School who struggles with reading has a suspected diagnosis of dyslexia and is currently not receiving the reading support she needs to be successful. As an educator of 17 years, I have worked diligently to learn and understand the science of reading in order to help other students become successful readers. It is concerning to me that while I am helping other children develop as readers, I have been unsuccessful in my attempts to partner with the administration at J.P. Ryan Elementary to advocate for my daughter's educational needs. I have been met with resistance throughout this entire process, with this year being the year with the most resistance from the current administration. I have attempted to receive information regarding the start date of my daughter's reading intervention services, requested a meeting with administration, and sent email correspondence to Dr. Tyler and Mrs. Barnett to no avail. It is my understanding that Charles County relies on evaluation and instructional methods such as balanced literacy, guided reading, LLI, and Fontes and Pinnell, all of which aren't aligned with the science of reading and do not help struggling readers and children like my own daughter. This fueled me to become even more knowledgeable about the science of reading, dyslexia, and reading best practices, which inspired me to advocate not only for my daughter, but other struggling readers. Learning to read is not a natural process. We are not born wired to read and write. We are born wired to talk. J.P. Ryan's ELA data supports the need for change, 
with only 29% of students being proficient in English language arts according to the school performance results of the 2018-19 school year. We can change this outcome and guarantee all students are proficient readers by incorporating structured literacy methods. Teachers need to be taught how to teach children to read. The research is clear. Explicit, systematic reading works. The science of reading works. I am appealing to the members of the board who I believe took this position out of love and dedication to all children of Charles County, not just children who are on grade level, to revisit the English language arts instructional practices within the district and consider the benefits the science of reading provides. I leave with this final thought. Allowing a student with a hidden disability, ADHD, anxiety, dyslexia, to struggle academically or socially when all that is needed for success are appropriate accommodations and explicit instruction is no different than failing to provide a ramp for a person in a wheelchair. Thank you for your time. Our next speaker is Dee Shelton. Good evening, my name is Dee Shelton. I drive bus 101 for James H. Stone Bus Company, but I am not speaking for Mr. Stone, nor am I speaking for any other bus driver. These are my personal thoughts and figures regarding the, the school bus driver's request for pay, raise, and benefits. Now, many of the married women in this room might relate to this scenario. Your dishwasher breaks, you ask your husband to fix it and he says, okay. Two weeks later, your vacuum breaks, you mention it to your husband and you get the same response. Shortly, you develop a water leak in the roof. Now you're upset. You have been washing dishes by hand for a month. You're trying to clean your carpet with a broom and now you have water leaking on your head. You are upset. You want things fixed now. And his response is, I can't fix everything. This is where we are with the school bus drivers. Excuse me. My first point will be the hourly raise. The national annual hourly raise is three to 5%. Within the last 12 years, we have received 3% one time. That was in 2019. Six of the 12 years, we received less than 3%. We got 2%, 2.5, and 2.7. Five years out of these 12, we have received no raise at all. Now, there was a recession, but our monthly bills did not go down. And as a point of fact, in four out of those five years that we didn't get a raise, my Charles County real estate tax went up. My second point is years of service steps. When I started 21 years ago, we had three steps, one to four, nine to five, and 10 plus. Approximately 10 years ago, a fourth step was added at 20 plus years of service. And they told us at that time that the intent was to, in the future, add a 15-year step and then add a 25-plus. Neither of those has ever been done. As of right now, our drivers have to wait 10 years between, <coughs> excuse me, I'm so nervous, between 10 and 20 before they earn a step raise. My third point is paid holidays. Federal employees work five days a week, 52 weeks, which equals 260 work days. For this, they receive a minimum of 10 paid holidays. School bus drivers work 180 days. So prorated, we should get at least seven days paid holidays. 
we do not get any, not one. During Christmas break, my two-week pay is usually three days, sometimes two, depending on the year. And I have to hope that it doesn't snow before I get my next paycheck because we don't get paid for that either. Now, I'm not going to discuss the snow. I know it's fluid. I understand that we make it up at the end of the year. But Christmas, Thanksgiving, and Easter are not fluid. We all know when they are. When I first started, transportation explained to me that this is a part-time job, which is why we don't get that benefit. But in the last 20 years, Charles County population has experienced an exponential growth rate and a dramatic climate change within the school system, resulting in a significant increase in responsibility, time, and effort put forth by the bus drivers. This is not a part-time job. We, this is my conclusion. We love our job, but like the frustrated wife who loves her lazy husband, there is only so much procrastination and excuse giving that we can afford to tolerate. I am appealing to you to fix, <coughs> to fix the water leak. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Don Richardson and Shaw. So the rest of our speakers are virtual. I'll turn it over to Ms. Mackey. Our first virtual speaker this evening is Pascal Small. Is this okay? Can everyone hear me? Oh, thank you. Um, Good evening. I planned on discussing ESSER funds today, but the urgency to address inequities of proximity um, just seems much greater, so I'm going to talk about that. Um, we know that the allocation of opportunity in society is greatly dependent on a great education, and right now many of our students in the virtual program are experiencing unequal access to high-quality and rigorous education. This includes lack of live instruction, unchallenging asynchronous work, and unsafe and unsupportive environments. Families are just now receiving access to electives, and we still continue to see security breaches. From the iReady data, you see the amount of students that are below grade level. We are aware of the reality due to disruptions in learning during COVID-19, and we have students experiencing unfinished learning and learning loss. But left unattended, learning loss of this magnitude, especially in our earlier grades, really could further compromise the prospects for a generation of children. Our district mentions 60-minute math and reading blocks, tutoring, and extended learning programs, while students don't even have a permanent teacher. These efforts, to me, are to help accelerate learning, yet some children aren't even receiving a full day of instruction. Um, to quote Dr. Navarro from earlier today, we should not shortchange our kids. So let's tackle the problem. Families would like CCPS to consider overseeing and delivering virtual instruction and moving away for proximity. We wish to see CCPS directly hire teachers through the district to support virtual instruction. It is in our children's best interest to be supported by their assigned school, which has a deeper vested commitment to our children's education and to upholding our high quality standard of education. Parents like myself are dizzy from the change of narrative around virtual instruction and resources, but we applaud the innovative adoption of technology to support learning in all environments and to solve some of the challenges we are facing around teacher burnout and shortages as we continue, continue hearing from our teachers. Many of us, myself included, are really excited to get our kids vaccinated. I just got Camila vaccinated on Sunday, and we're excited to return to in-person learning. But that does not mean the problems with or the virtual program will go away, as virtual learning is here to stay. Every child deserves a supportive, safe, and challenging learning environment. Paralysis on this issue and throwing more resources as Band-Aid solutions is not working. I will end with a quick plug to families in our community to make sure we all participate in the family engagement opportunities mentioned today. 
I also do want to say, say, say thank you to CCPS um, and Dr. Navarro for a wonderful ESSER community engagement meeting. It was really nice to be able to ask questions and have real conversations rather than just a share out. So we do appreciate that. Thank you. Hello, can everybody hear me? Hello, um, I am a teacher at John Hanson Middle School, and tonight I'd like to address the issue of transparency when it comes to COVID health mandates um, from Charles County Schools. So being a teacher, since we ask questions all the time, I have a line of questions here that I just like to get right to. So number one, why is it that Charles County Schools and Health Department solely are solely focusing on infection rates and case numbers as justification for mask mandates and potential vaccine mandates? Why are recovery rates for kids ages zero through 17 not being focused on or talked about? What is the efficacy of the PCR test given that it has yielded so many false positives for SARS-CoV-2? And why is that test being used to diagnose SARS-CoV-2 when the founder of the test, Kerry Mullis, admitted that you can't use a PCR to prove infectious etiology or to diagnose an infectious disease? Given the above and combined with the extremely high recovery rates of kids ages 0 through 17, why are PCR tests still being used to diagnose kids with SARS-CoV-2? Furthermore, if the PCR test was never intended to diagnose SARS-CoV-2, then how many kids are being misdiagnosed with SARS-CoV-2 when it's really just a case of influenza or the common cold? What are the long-term effects of wearing a mask over your face, restricting your breathing for long periods of time? How is this affecting our students, all of us, not just physically, but mentally and emotionally? If these so-called vaccines are so effective, why are so many people still catching SARS-CoV-2 after taking them? Why is the efficacy of natural immunity not being discussed? If it's true that 93% of the people getting sick with SARS-CoV-2 are unvaccinated, according to Mr. Stoddard, wouldn't that mean that these people have natural immunity? And if natural immunity is more effective than those vaccines, according to the Israeli study, which says that it is, why would students be still be required to get a vaccine when they have natural immunity to SARS-CoV-2? Given the many adverse reactions to these inoculations in such a short span of time, why are the various reports not being discussed by the board? And why are kids still being required to get these inoculations of SARS-CoV-2 or a SARS-CoV-2 test in order to play sports or participate in extracurriculars? According to the Stanford study, the size of the SARS-CoV-2 virus has a microscopic diameter of 60 to 140 nanometers, one billionth of a meter, while medical and non-medical face masks have a thread diameter that ranges from 55 to 440 micrometers, one millionth of a meter, which is more than 1,000 times larger than the actual size of the SARS-CoV-2 virus, and therefore can easily pass through a face mask. <clears throat> so how are face masks really protecting us from a microscopic virus? Why are the po positive effects of proper nutrition, vitamin and mineral supplementation as cures to overcome SARS-CoV-2 not being discussed? Do the organizations, CDC, NIH, who, local and state departments and Charles County schools who are influencing our counties, or excuse me, those organizations who are, in influence are influencing our counties and school districts decisions really have people's health and well-being in mind. Who are these organizations accountable to? Yes, I'm shortly done. I'm asking the school board for transparency on these matters to stand up and be accountable for the health and safety of staff and students on these matters. It's critical that we look at these matters in a more thorough manner rather than just focusing on one or two aspects, such as case numbers and infection rates as the sole justification for health and safety procedures. I think we can all see with the demands of contact tracing, quarantining and masking of staff and students, it's causing a tr tremendous burden on all of us and isn't sustainable in my opinion. These items I brought forth, I feel need to be given more time and attention to by the school board since it's such an important health issue we are all facing right now. <clears throat> I think this could result and better decisions and procedures for these matters going forward. Right now, we all need to be asking questions about these matters. These are our kids, our students, our lives, our voices, and they all matter. Thank you for your time. Okay. Thank you. All right.
Next on our agenda is action items. <clears throat> the first the first order of business is approval of minutes. Um, there are a series of minutes that need to be approved. The first is the executive session minutes of October 12th of 2021 board meeting. I will entertain a motion. So moved. Moved by Mrs. McGraw. Second. Second by Ms. Brown. All in favor? Mr. Hancock, Ms. Brown, Mrs. McGraw, Mr. Lucas, Ms. Wilson, approves? Opposed? Abstain. Uh, Ms. Um, Abel abstains and Mr. Hurd abstains. Motion carries. Second uh, minutes, regular minutes of, for the October 12, 2021 board meeting. So moved. Second. Moved by Mr. Hurd, second by Ms. Brown. Those in favor, raise your hand. Mr. Hurd, Mr. Hancock, Ms. Brown, Mrs. McGraw, Mr. Lucas, Ms. Wilson, in favor? Any opposed? Abstain. One abstain, Ms. Abel. Motion carries. Third set of minutes, which is the legislative breakfast that took place for October 25th, 2021. So moved. Moved by Ms. Abel. Second. Second by Ms. Brown. Those in favor? Mr. Mr. Hurd, Mr. Hancock, Ms. Brown, Mrs. McGraw, Ms. Abel, Mr. Lucas, Ms. Wilson, motion carries. The work session minutes for October 25th, 2021. So moved. Moved by Mrs. McGraw. Second, Second by Mr. Hurd. All those in favor? Mr. Hurd, Mr. Hancock, Ms. Brown, Mrs. McGraw, Ms. Abel, Mr. Lucas, Ms. Wilson. Motion carries. Lastly, the executive session minutes of October 28, 2021. So moved. moved by Ms. Brown. Second. Second by Mr. Hancock. All those in favor? Mr. Hancock, Ms. Brown, Mrs. McGraw, Ms. Abel, Mr. Lucas, Ms. Wilson um, votes yes. Abstain. One abstain by Mr. Hurd. Next order of business, business is personnel. So moved. Moved by Ms. Abel. Second. Second by Mrs. McGraw. All those in favor? Mr. Hancock, Ms. Brown, Mrs. McGraw, Ms. Abel, Mr. Lucas, Ms. Wilson. Motion carries. Middle school redistricting. Ms. McGraw, Mrs. McGraw. I move to accept the superintendent's recommendations for with amendments for proposal A. Motion made by Mrs. McGraw. Second. Second by Ms. Brown. Discussion. Mr. Hancock. Thank you, Madam Chair. I know. I want to thank the staff for this. I know we've we voted on this last month and it. We're at a stalemate. Um, all in all, I think it's a good plan. I just want to plead to my fellow board members on the reality of what we're about to do here. Um, the reality is we're about to overcrowd a school in a very rural portion of the, of the county to no fault of their own. Families and citizens that live in this county and have lived here for a long time, and we're about to provide a tremendous amount of much needed relief to Milton Summers, a tremendous amount. Their population is gonna decrease by 418 students to be under capacity for the first time in a very, very long time. But my fear, this is all riding on what's gonna happen at Heritage Green. What if Heritage Green doesn't move as fo fa forward as fast as it is anticipated to? And then we have Benjamin Stoddard that's been renovated and is going to be over capacity from day one of next year and then we have pickle waxing that's going to be jump from 450 students to 569 students in a small school like that i am telling you I, I my son goes there that school cannot handle that amount of students i cannot vote for this and i don't think this is the best option for this county Any further discussion? 
Ms. Abel. I already stated earlier why I cannot support this um, amendment, so I can not vote for it. Any other further discussion? Mr. Lucas. Thank you, Ms. Wilson. Um, <clears throat> so after our last board meeting, when, when we couldn't come to a, um, a majority decision, uh, I met several times um, with Mr. Heim and Mr. Andrews. Thank you very much for your time and for the information that you provided to the rest of the board subsequent to those meetings. And, um, you know, based on our meetings and discussion, um, this is what the superintendent has put forth. And, um, you know, there's no, there's no perfect answer. And from the beginning, um, when we looked at the, the blocks that were being moved and moving by blocks is, is, is part of the issues, but it's what we've always done and, and that, that's not going to change anytime soon. Um, I spoke about uh, the neighborhood in Waldorf and Glen Eagles and then we, we talked we talked today about the, the neighborhoods in um, in La Plata and kids move schools and that's nothing new it happened to my son he was redistricted and, and that will always happen but when you when you add in the fact that you take neighborhoods and we could have a discussion about what adjoining neighborhoods are but when you when you have them go to a different school and you move a kid, that's that's kind of a double hit on on that um, on that child's education. And uh, I brought forth something last uh, board meeting that um, you know wasn't seconded, so we could discuss it. And it, it was uh, admittedly a pretty uh, a pretty uh, radical departure. But again, echoing what Mr. Hancock said, um, this is this is predicated on on Heritage Green, and, and I'm not confident that that amount of development is going to happen in the time frame um, that um, we're being told that it's going to happen. Um, but be that as may, we we have to take the numbers not only from that neighborhood but from other neighborhoods all across the county, and and we we treat them all the same way in terms of of the planned growth. Um, but one, one slight change to this that, that I'm not gonna make a motion, but if my fellow board members would, would entertain it, um, in that block in Waldorf, which is block 2643, um, currently there are only 43 kids that attend summers. Most of the kids in that block um, go to Stoddard and, and that's because of the moratorium that was put in place several years ago. Um, I think it would, it would be, um, a little more, um, um, it would go over a little better if for those kids, if, if they could finish their middle school at summers and then the block would still, I mean, obviously the kids that are going to Stoddard now, it's not a change for them to stay at Stoddard. And then any other kids, um, you know, that enter the middle school age, they would go to Stoddard. But that would only be something that would happen for two years. And that way they're not facing switching schools and having been in, in a divided neighborhood. I, I think I just would kind of gauge the appetite of the board um, for that to happen. Um, and that's, that's regardless whether we go with option A the way it is um, or the option that's presented or as, as my fellow board members have pointed out, um, having kids go to, uh, to go to Summers instead of, uh, instead of pickle waxing. But uh, I just, uh, I make that comment and and there is somewhat of a precedent for that we did that in an elementary school redistricting we allowed kids to finish in their elementary school in the fifth grade because they had been redistricted several times so it's not unprecedented that we would uh, that we would do this for kids that are uh, that have started their middle school and and that way they can finish and um, not have uh, as I said not not get hit twice in terms of 
being in a, in a disjointed neighborhood and having to switch middle schools. So that was, a, that was my big comment, and I, I didn't share that with anybody in, until this point. Um, I, I understand we, we have to make the decision, and, and we're going to make a decision tonight. Um, but uh, I don't know how my board members feel about what I just said about those, um, those 43 kids that are, uh, that are in Glen Eagle South, if that would even be a possibility. Any further comments? Motion on the floor to uh, Mr. Hancock. Well, I was going to say I can support Mr. Lucas on that. Could we do this? If the same thing would apply for Block Three Thirty Four Forty One, remaining at Summers for a couple of years. Table. You think it needs to come forth in the form of an amendment to the motion? Well, there's a motion on, on the floor. We can vote. There can be an amendment to the motion too. So, okay. So I'll I'll, I'll make an amendment. So so. There's a, Miss McGraw made a motion. Um. I'd like to amend that a motion so that students in block 2643 that currently at attend Milton Summers can finish their middle school at Milton Summers. How many kids are we talking about, Mike? 43. Motion on the floor. We've seconded it. There is a motion on the floor. Is there a second? Hearing no second. M motion. The motion dies. Mm -hmm. Ms. Abel? Motion very similar to Mr. Lucas's. However, we are talking 58 students that are comprised with Jamestown and Quailwood. I would like for to make a motion to, that they stay at Summers. Second. Motion made by Ms. Abel. Second by Mr. Hancock. <clears throat> Discussion? Hearing no further discussion, those in favor? Of the amendment. Of the amendment. Mr. Hancock, uh, Ms. Uh, Ms. Abel, Ms. Wilson. Opposed? Opposed is Ms. Brown. Um, Mrs. McGraw and Mr. Lucas. Back to the original motion. Mm -hmm. Yep. Back to the original motion. Uh, is who's is there a second for the original mo motion? Yeah, already was. Seconded. Any further discussion? Those in favor to the original motion, and that is it. Can you let's be, be clear with the original motion? This is the amend amend a uh, superintendent's am it proposal A with the superintendent's amendment to include those two blocks. Okay, so that we're clear, uh, and Miss Mrs. Stubblefield can um, um, can record it for the record. It discussion. Those in favor. <clears throat> um, Ms. Brown, Mrs. McGraw, Mr. Lucas, uh, Ms. Wilson, opposed? Ms. Abel and Mr. Hancock, motion carries. 
Uh, next, I will entertain a motion. Uh, is there any other further business? I'm looking at it. I will entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Moved by Ms. Abel. Second. By Mr. Hancock. Motion, motion carries.